Scandal with its talented stars, Sienna Miller and Michelle Dockery. Plus, Chanel was up late last night. She had a big night over at the Met Gala and was going to recap all the wild looks and excitement from that red carpet. And then later, we're marking the original release of one of our favorite comedies, Bridesmaids. We've got a fun blast from the past with that cast. But first, here's today's pop start headlines. This trailer for this movie, Olivia Wilde's new movie, oh, looks right. awesome. I watched it this morning. It's called Don't Worry, Darling. And the first trailer is out for the highly anticipated movie that stars Little Women's Florence Pugh, Harry Styles, Chris Pine, and Olivia Wilde, who doubles as director on the project. It's also in it. It's a psychological thriller. It follows a group of couples who live in a utopian 1950s community where the wives are expected to never question what their husbands actually do for a living. Mm. But it all starts to crumble when Pugh's character, Alice, would like to know a little more. Take a look. <laughs> the one thing they ask of us is to stay here. Where it's safe. Do you even know what the Victory Project actually is? Have you ever asked? Do you? Stop it, Alice. What if this place is dangerous? What if Stop it! No. Jack. It's okay. I'm curious to hear where she's going with this. Oh. It looks so good. It's yeah. got like oh. WandaVision vibes. Yes. It's got like Mad Men. Stepford Step Wives. Step wives. <laughs> it's, you know, oh, it looks so good. This is uh, Harry Styles is in it. It's not the first time he's been in a movie. The 2017, you might recall the Grammy winner was in the World War II film Dunkirk. Oh, he was right. also in The Eternals. But this is much more of a of, of heavy lifting for Harry, who seems excellent in it. The movie looks great. It's slated to hit theaters Love this the title. fall. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, darling. Right. Oh. Mm -hmm. Next up, George Carlin, HBO giving the legendary comedian the documentary Treatment, the project called George Carlin's American dream is going to feature interviews from some of comedy's biggest names jerry seinfeld john stewart bill burr and chris rock just to name a few the film's going to explore the ups and downs of george carlin's personal life and his career as well as his most memorable moments including yes those <laughs> seven words you can never say on television here's a peek he was funny he was smart he was opinionated i want it to be just like him he was just so cool Here's the list of words you can't say all the time. Stand-up's the hardest thing. He did the hardest thing for the longest time. He was challenging society to be better. Life is sacred? Who said so? God? Hey, if you read history, you realize that God is one of the leading causes of death. Oh. George Carlin's American Dream is going to stream on HBO Max. In two parts. It's okay to laugh at yeah. I didn't see that coming. I didn't two, see that coming. In two parts. That starts on May 20th. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. And finally, Lady Gaga, the Grammy winner, is soaring for the high notes on a new ballad off the Top Gun Maverick soundtrack. She just released a song overnight. It's called Hold My Hand. And then she shared the sort of message behind the lyrics. It was written specifically for the film. Gaga wrote, Life taught me through hard times to have faith in humanity when it's hard to have faith in yourself. When you feel lonely, sad, removed from the world, far away from yourself and others, hold my hand. Here's a little bit of that song. That sounds Whoa. good. Yeah. That sounds like it's for a blockbuster. Good. Too. Yeah, Top yeah, Gun good. and Top Gun, good duo there. Earlier this week, she even hung out with Maverick himself, writing to, on this uh, picture of them. Thank you for coming to my show last night. I love you, my friend. That movie, by the way, looks awesome too. That was supposed to come out July 12th, 2019. Oh, wow. Several push dates later, and they say it's like the perfect film. We've been waiting our whole lives for Top Gun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And now to the reason we call the show Popstar Plus. A few more headlines for you, starting with Ellen DeGeneres. It's the final month of the talk show host's long-running daytime program. Ellen's bringing back some of her biggest guests to close it all out. Today, her wife, Portia de Rossi, is going to be stopping by with some suggestions for Ellen's next chapter. I want to make sure that you continue being a teacher because that's really what you've been for everybody. And, you know, I just, I just feel like more than ever, we need love and light and laughter. And uh, so I, I hope that you continue to do something like that, uh, like stand up, for example. Mm -hmm. or, uh... Yeah, maybe a little more stand up. Sounds like the audience agrees with that. Until then, she's going to continue hosting the Ellen DeGeneres show until the finale. That'll be on May 26. Next up, Josh Brolin. Fair warning to all the girl dads out there. This one's a tearjerker. On Monday, the Proud Papa posted this photo, riding in the car with his daughter Eden from her wedding over the weekend. 
Roland captioning the photo with a sweet tribute that reads, in part, when your daughter gets married, it all shows up. The memories, the life lived or not, and how certain relationships resonate. My son and my daughters are happy, contented. All the greatest gifts have no form and sit there waiting to be acknowledged. That wasn't a poignant post on Instagram. Can you imagine what the father of the bride's speech must have been like? Big congratulations going out to Eden and her new husband, Cameron. All right, we've covered your headlines for you. Next up, the cast of Anatomy of a Scandal delves into what makes that show just so bingeable. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. you got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. Yes, I love it. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Who comes back together? Oh, I'm so you know, happy. At least. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. Anatomy of a Scandal follows a British politician and his wife as they navigate a very public scandal and court case. The drama features a star-studded cast that includes Santa Miller, Michelle Dockery, and Rupert Friend. They told us what makes the show just so riveting and what could be in store for a second season. So Anatomy of a Scandal is a six-part binge-worthy thriller which is centered around a politician and his wife who get embroiled in a sex scandal which threatens to bring their lives crashing down around them. And the British government. And the British government. The story tells um, each narrative from the perspective of the women who are caught up in its wake. Making this right is all I care about. Didn't question little things when I should have. Won't your wife be wondering where you are? She trusts me. But little things add up. I mean. Well, I think where our director was was pretty genius. I mean, a story like this, you could very much cast in a different way. You could have somebody who read as an as a villain very clearly and and it would be much more black and white. What S.J. Clarkson did was spend time in the gray, which I think is essential in a story like this, and show many different people's memories of the same event and how recall is really unreliable often. Um, and everybody's version can be different. And so in some ways, the audience are left to make up their own minds in the end. And I think that there will be polarizing opinions about what actually happened and that should hopefully lead to some arguing, healthy argument, and, and hopefully thought-provoking material. She wouldn't give you what you wanted, and that is why you had to force yourself on I her. I didn't force myself on and her. And that's why she's accused you of rape. I am not a rapist. I did not rape her. The word rape and my name have nothing to do with each other. I have no further questions for this witness. I do not think my character gets what she deserves. I think that's also the, the sad reality of, of a lot of these cases. Yeah, hopefully, again, creates, you know, with those court case scenes, I just hope it kind of creates conversation around how, how, how we feel about what we're seeing, like the audience members, whether they lean one way or another, like asking ourselves why and why something you know, makes a a witness more unreliable um, when really that's, you know, in, it, when you step away from it, that shouldn't make, uh, you know, a witness more un unreliable. And what are those things in society that are there um, that, that kind of um, 
add to that for whatever reason? Well, I, f I feel like for Kate, I feel that she reaches a point of peace. I, th I, I feel that she isn't, you know, for the majority of what you see of her in the show, she's not at peace with who she is as a person, her past. Um, she needs some sort of closure on it. And, you know, through this journey and this big risk that she takes in prosecuting someone that she knows and her, her attacker, she actually sort of, by the end, becomes closer to who she really is. Yeah, I mean, I don't, we don't really know what's going to happen to James, but the idea that he has to be accountable for his actions, I think that's, that's right and proper, and, you know, that he has to effectively have a moral code, which he claims to have had, but clearly his actions and his words have not lined up in the past. So to me, that was a sense, there's a sense of justice, at least the beginning of a sense of justice there. Yeah, and I think Sophie's taken the first few steps towards some form of self-analysis and independence from the life that she was raised to want, which was to be the perfect wife of the perfect man with the perfect children and the perfect house. She's really questioning what she's compromised for that and discovering who she might be had she made different decisions. And I think she's on a good path towards something better, or at least more truthful. I liked that this felt like something that was um, playing out in real time. It wasn't like there was a buried treasure that then comes to light. It comes to light in front of our eyes, and we watch these people dealing with the blows that are dealt them uh, before our eyes. And so that gave it to me a sense of kind of ur urgency, like emotional urgency, which was exciting. I think the series does end with a door slightly ajar, certainly for Michelle Dockery's part. She's so mm. brilliant in this, and what's that next case that she will be prosecuting? Um, I'm not sure, we'll have, we'll have to see, but it's good that you're left wondering, for sure. Well, I think this show certainly is left on uh, a kind of note of, you know, what's to come, because of course it's the beginning of another story at the end, mm. you know, and, but there's definitely, it definitely feels like there is a momentum at the end that could potentially lead into something else. Who knows? I mean, mm. I don't often kind of, unless there is a, you know, an idea mm. that the writers have and, mm. you know, you've been told a rumour that something's actually going to continue, then I would, I'd be curious to yeah. know. But, um, yeah, I'd leave that up to the, mm. the experts, the writers, to see where the characters go. We should mention uh, you can catch Anatomy of a Scandal, of course, on Netflix. Coming up next, who did Chanel encounter? Who was Chanel hanging out with over at the Met Gala? Stick around. All the big names and all the fashions from last night's big event coming up. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything That's you need. What comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now.
And welcome back. Chanel Jones had a very fun assignment last night. She took to the Met Gala red carpet to chat with some of the biggest names in fashion, Hollywood, sports, and more. Take a look at this. The biggest stars stepped out in their finest here in New York City last night, and our very own Chanel had a front row seat uh -huh. to all the action. Good morning, you're slumming with us Good this morning, morning. Yeah. No, please. I'm awake. Uh -huh. Okay, there was no shortage of glitz and glamour. All of the stars dressed to the nines for this year's theme honoring the lavish Gilded Age. The party of the year returning to the Met in a big way with show-stopping looks that have people talking this morning. glamour on full display. Can you just tell us who you're wearing tonight? I'm wearing Versace. Tell me who you're wearing. Oscar de la Renta. Alicia, who are you wearing? Who are you wearing, Chloe? I'm wearing John Batista Valley. At the hottest ticket in town, the star-studded Met Gala. This is one of the largest crowds I've seen here in a few years. Who do you think it is? I think everybody's ready to come back and be together back and bigger than ever on the first Monday of May. This is the fashion event of the year. The theme this year is Gilded Glamour. So of course everyone puts their spin on it. They come up these steps and strike a pose. This year's theme, an ode to the lavish Gilded Age of the late 19th century. What were you saying about the future? Gilded Glamour from the future. With crystals, crowns, and feathers galore. Tell me who you're wearing this evening. Um, I'm wearing Chanel. Yes. Wow, fitting because my name is Chanel. <laughs> <laughs> what do you make of the Met Gala? Why is it so delightful? I think it's a celebration of fashion, and I think it's a, a celebration of New York. This year's gala co-chairs, including Blake Lively, Ryan Reynolds, and Lin-Manuel Miranda, leading the charge on the museum's iconic steps. Lively, stunning, in Versace, serving two looks in one. Now that's what you called gilded glamour. Drawing inspiration from the Big Apple, including Lady Liberty herself. Before she did this costume change, I thought it was the most beautiful dress I've ever seen. Now she just drop the mic. It feels very heavy and very beautiful. It's, it's like a workout. Alicia Keys also channeling an empire state of mind. We asked Alicia what was in her hair. Her response, discs. How fantastic is this? I mean, it's amazing to be here. My dress is sustainable and beautiful. <laughs> and the night featuring fresh faces. It's my first time. I've never been here before. As well as some fan favorites. Sarah Jessica Parker was behind me and I was like, I love your dress. And she was like, I love yours. And I, I'm lucky I didn't faint, but I did inside. <laughs> Sarah Jessica Parker is the belle of the ball. That hat. From the hats all the way down to the nails. Hey, can we see your nails? Let me see your nails. I'm always killing it with the nails. Oh my goodness. Stars pulling out all the stops at this year's gala. It's heavy, but nothing's heavy when it's just heavy. Who are you with? I mean, you're not with your hubby, but... I'm not with my hubby tonight, but I'm gonna run inside and try to find all my friends. The special night also turning into a family affair. Billionaire Elon Musk arriving to the party with his model mom in his first appearance since buying Twitter. And some of the most famous sisters glittering down the red carpet including Kourtney Kardashian in a coordinated ensemble with her new fiance, rocker Travis Barker. But it was undoubtedly Kim Kardashian who stole the show. There's no question about it. People have been waiting all night long for Kim Kardashian and Pete Davidson. Kim Kardashian wearing the actual dress worn by Marilyn Monroe when she sang to President Kennedy. Between the show-stopping looks and some of the jaw-dropping moments, We also made sure to save time for plenty of fun. What are we doing tonight? We're turning up! Making for another unforgettable night at the Met. I think everybody's really happy that we're back. It's magic. It's like a fairy tale. It was oh, fun. fun. Yeah. It, was, it was the largest crowd I have seen in years. I mean, as far as the eye could see, people are lined up across Fifth Avenue here in New York City just to get a glimpse of whatever this is. Like, we recognize there's a lot of things happening in the world, but everybody seemed to say, you know what, last night, let's just push the pause button for a moment and just. But it's you know, more than that for people watching this show and they think it's just that. Yeah, it's, it's a not night, that. right? It's a charity yeah, night. It's a charity night. It's a fundraiser, and fundraiser, they definitely right. raise a lot of money. I mean, money that will go, you know, to students. Everybody pretends to eat. They don't actually. I don't think they eat. And they always say. <laughs> and you know, they don't 
I should say this. While uh, cameras are all over the red carpet, guests are actually asked to put away their phones once they're inside. Oh. But we can tell you Vogue, Vogue magazine, which or organizes the annual event, says the gala featured surprise performances by Casey Musgraves and Lenny Kravitz. Oh. You know, they always do the bathroom selfie. Yeah. What's fun is to ask people who they're most looking forward you know, to seeing. Thing. So they're all together. Yeah. And it's a range of celebs. I mean, mm -hmm. you have musicians, you have artists, you have Blink Close, and then you have... Yeah. Uh, you know, John make Matisse. the stallion. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? Was so. there someone you enjoyed most? Ah, that's a really good question. I was just telling you guys, in person, Blake Lively's dress. Mm -hmm. Stunning. Yeah. Mm. Stunning. Yeah. It was absolutely gorgeous. You know who else was stunning? Who? You, my yes, dear. Yes, you are. You look great. Deb Weber in our wardrobe department. Yeah. She's our fairy godmother, yeah. right? Uh, and great. Bianca and Debbie Bells. Like, thank you guys. You look beautiful. Oh, you thank beautiful. you. And my friend Gwen right. Stefani looked beautiful. She Gwen Stefani. They look like works of art, Carson. Yeah. Like when they come down the carpet. What a fun night. I think Chanel looked better than all of them. Still to come, the cast of Bridesmaids and how they got into their hilarious characters next. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Who comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. NBC News, streaming free now. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. We want to take you back to the year 2011. That's when one of our favorite movies came out, Bridesmaids. It hit theaters. And with this month marking 11 years since its release, we dug up our very first interview with the cast. Some women love it and some hate it. Either way, being a bridesmaid is an honor. Despite having to buy the all too often tacky mm -hmm. dress, you might consider turning into a tablecloth or something worse one day. Well, now there is a movie that feels your pain as well as the pleasure. It's called Bridesmaids, and it stars Saturday Night Live's Kristen Wiig as the maid of honor whose life unravels as she leads a group of colorful bridesmaids. Take a look. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to say. You look... <laughs> Megan, are you okay? I think I just... My dress was probably just tight. Oh, my God. You got food poisoning from that restaurant, didn't you? No, I had the same thing that she had, and I, I feel fine. <laughs> oh, my. Okay. Oh, no. What is this happening? Nothing's happening. Oh, my God. <sighs> you know, I don't really care which dress we get. It doesn't matter to me. I just need to get off this white carpet. No, okay. Get off the white carpet. <laughs> oh, and they tried to get you out of that shop really quickly. Yes. Right? Yeah. They're all with us today, the bridesmaids. Rose Byrne, Ellie Kemper, and Wendy McClendon Covey. Hello, ladies. Hi. Nice to Hello. see you. Had a ball making this so smooth. Much fun. Such fun. Oh, okay, fun. it was really fun today. Opening USA Today, and there you are. Look at oh you. You haven't seen it. No. 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 We are having so much fun. Yeah, you guys we are. are having a lot of fun. Oh, here comes the launch. Here comes the launch. Oh, oh, oh. They're saying oh, that, that this is like the female raunchy version of the Hangover. Hangover. Do you guys do you agree? Is that a compliment? Um, well, it I, is a compliment. I, I see I what they're saying. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. Well, what? it's going to make billions of dollars. Yeah. Like, hang up. So it is exactly like it. Yeah. Yes. In yeah. that respect. Yeah. Yes. And isn't Judd but, one of the? No, who's one of the uh, producers? Yeah. Judd Apatow. Judd Apatow. Mm -hmm. So he is. So he, he knows raunch. He, he knows it well. Yeah, but he knows it's co-written by Kristen and a friend of hers Annie as well. Mama. So yeah. it's raunch from a lady's standpoint. Well, well from a slut standpoint. It's lady raunch. It's lady <laughs> slut. Right. And, <laughs> and we like that each each of your characters is so distinct, distinctively different. You're sort of this type 
a one that people don't fall in love with right away. Yeah, Am so I right? Yeah, she's kind of the, the villainess of the film, but I think at the end she sort of gets her redemption, and you know, so she's not. I, I think we all have dimension. It's well, like she's the one with a little history with the. Yes, with, yes. Well, she's yeah, she's very competitive with Kristen yes. and yeah. kind of winds her up and everything. But <laughs> we had a lot of fun. It was a little, very hard for me not to laugh because we did a lot of improvising, and these girls are so brilliant at it. And, we and you're so good at losing your British and... accent, by the way. Oh. I had no idea. I just wow. I didn't Australian. Know. Australian. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Close. Yeah. There's, you know, there's somehow in the kingdom. Them, although miles and miles apart. <laughs> Your character's interesting too. Very naive very and naive. sort of, I mean, we, we love you from the sweet. office, yes, but yeah. Yes, wide-eyed, innocent, a very set view of marriage. Thinks anyone who isn't married is doomed for life. Yes, yeah. it's over. <laughs> and a lot of people still feel that way. A lot of people still do, yes, yeah. yes. Um, it gets a little tutorial yeah. from this one. Yes, because so you're, you're the raunchy, you're the raunchy one. I'm <laughs> the oldest be. bridesmaid, the cousin of the bride, the one who needs a bachelorette party the most. <laughs> because it's got to get me through the rest of my marriage. So I'm really banking on having a good time at this. I think a lot of us can relate to your character. I, I think a lot of people can. Yeah. yeah. And your character has three uh, young kids, is three that right? Three brat kids yeah. that hate me and I hate them. <laughs> and I think that in the, in the beginning of my marriage, I was like this one and I thought, oh, this is the best it's yeah. ever going to get. Years down the line, I'm like, Get me out of here. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. So. Have you guys? Were you guys bridesmaids in in real life? And did you have any similar experiences? I have not. These ladies have both. You both have been. I've been a bridesmaid times. seven times. Oh my! I've God. been a bridesmaid eight times. See, they don't they do don't that in Australia. Australia. What? Yeah, they're or very Britain. sensible. Yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't have people that you don't have people that stand up with you at weddings. Ah, uh, well, though, we, it, I don't think it's as big a deal as it is in you know America. Everything's kind of larger yeah. than life. Yeah. Yes. I think in Australia yes. it's probably not. You have to tell us about the locket. Oh, Didn't oh, yeah. your director gave all of you this? Director Paul Feig, the last true gentleman. Yeah. Gave us, look at this. I don't know where, am I? Oh, oh, yes. there we are. Now, look, now, that's, that's us, that nice. that's the bridesmaids. I can't do it. For you. You're right there. Okay. We see you. God, that was such a funny movie. Who doesn't love bridesmaids? Well, that's going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for taking the time to enjoy this episode of Popstar Plus. We hope you did, and we hope you'll come back tomorrow for a little bit more. Tomorrow, by the way, get ready for a new season of Girls 5 Eva. You're welcome. That's tomorrow. See you then. Today, all day. All day? Today, all day. All day. This is a long oh, way of asking man, yeah. who's your favorite okay. character you've ever all played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> what is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. Yeah. I don't want the rap, <laughs> Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Hi, buddy Cal. Cooking with me. Dad's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today. With simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit <laughs> now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do a weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. Okay. Oh look at it. Doesn't it doesn't look, look so good. No, it doesn't look good. Okay. Will you judge okay. us in a cook-off? I yeah. will, and okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day.
and welcome to Wellness Today. I'm Chanel Jones. Today we're celebrating women on the move, exploring how women have used movement to empower themselves and their communities over the last 70 years. We'll take a look at how exercise changes throughout a woman's life from puberty to menopause. Plus, we'll learn what surprising item inspired the design of the first sports bra and the best ways to eat before, during, and after a workout. And we'll introduce you to a new fitness platform that's making room for everyone to get moving. This is Women on the Move. Although today it's common to see a woman heading to the gym or out for a jog, it's still a relatively new phenomenon, a movement decades in the making. From jogging and jazzercise to Pilates and hits, over the years women have celebrated their bodies through exercise, but it hasn't always been this way. In the 1950s and 1960s, exercise was considered pretty taboo for women. There were fears that it could damage her or actually make her uterus fall out, and sweat was considered taboo and unladylike. Thanks to the work of dozens of fitness visionaries like Bonnie Pruden, Lottie Burke, and Jane Fonda, women were excited to get up and move. Now go into toe steps. Put your heels up. As fitness for women became more accepted, it also became more expected. There are so many kind of implicit messages being sent to girls and women from a very young age that to be a woman is to be forever working on your body and to view your body as a project. And the community has not always encouraged everybody to participate. Women's fitness has a history of, of catering to mostly white, middle to upper class women. But everyone deserves to have access to the truly beneficial things that, that fitness can do for our, our mental, physical, and emotional health. The lessons learned through exercise empower other areas of women's lives. Strength begets strength. When you feel physically empowered, when you feel good in your own skin, that can translate to how you make your way in the world. Whether you like to run, dance, or stretch in your home, in the park, or at the gym, women have found their favorite ways to break a sweat. I think we're really at the beginning of a moment where we're, we're learning to harness exercise in a way that's truly about feeling good and, and feeling strong. Using exercise to harness our power. I love that. All right, let's talk a little bit. Joining us now is OBGYN, Dr. Camila Phillips, the founder of Cala Women's Health in New York City. And she's here to explain why exercise is so important at different points in a woman's life. Thank you for talking with us today. Thank you for having me. So we know that a woman's uh, you know, body continues to change over time, but we should be exercising all throughout. So let's break it down into puberty, pregnancy, and then menopause. We'll right. start with puberty, if you will. Um, you know, when girls go through puberty, their bodies change. And they've noticed, teachers have noticed, and experts have noticed, that's when a girl almost pulls back sometimes. Before, she's running all over the place, running around the playground, and then she starts to get a little self-conscious. She may not want to exercise. How do we push through that? You know, why, And why is it so important for teenage girls to stay active? Right. Puberty is such an awkward time for so many young people. I remember it myself, just feeling strange in your mm -hmm. own body. So being active is really important in helping them reconnect. And I like to think outside the box with activity. It doesn't have to be running. It can be soccer, basketball, contact sports, really thinking outside for them to help them engage in different parts of their body. It helps them maintain um, a sense of pride and enthusiasm about what wellness and strength can be and that they embody that. And your doctor, so if a girl is having cramps, exercise I know can help, right? Right. It's really important to remember that when we work out, your body releases an amazing assortment of endorphins, which are natural pain killers and so before we go to reach for some um, pill mm -hmm. you know sometimes moving your body jogging around the block doing a dance party in your living room can help release those endorphins and help with menstrual pain I love that all right let's talk about pregnancy another big life event if you will exercise I know it certainly depends on the woman so you definitely need to check with your doctor one of my pregnancies I was walking all over the place my sister's like working out when she's pregnant my twins I couldn't even walk so right good night everybody right uh, but what's the thought when it comes to exercise and pregnancy yeah. 
Yeah. See. Well, we've really had a paradigm shift as it relates to being active in pregnancy. So the days of laying on the couch are no more. Mm -hmm. We encourage women who um, are having normal, safe pregnancies to get out there and move your body. It helps reduce the risk of C-section, gestational diabetes and hypertension, and really can help with the marathon of labor. Are there any exercises that you shouldn't do when mm -hmm. you're pregnant? So you really want to use your best judgment. Anything that involves contact is probably sure, not the sure. best idea. Yeah, yeah. So soccer, basketball, those kind of things. You can do a stationary bike because your risk of falling is, is minimal, but you want to use your best judgment. Swimming, low impact exercises are best. And what about post-pregnancy, what would you say? Exercise is key post-pregnancy. So when you're active while you're pregnant, it helps your recovery postpartum. Women who have gained the extra weight tend to lose it faster. It helps with your mental health and warding off postpartum depression because you're still staying active and engaging and also can help with toning your core and getting back to your regular clothes. All right, so now I think I'm in the, what am I, almost 44. There's perimenopause and then mm -hmm. menopause. There's, and it gets harder, right. frankly, to, to, to lose the weight or to try to stay fit but what are your what's your advice once a woman starts to go through menopause like I understand um, you recommend that they start using weights for example I think a lot of women are often very afraid of picking up weight I am sometimes yeah, well, it's, because I'm, it's, I'm for you know you don't want you're worried about bulking, bulking up. up yes <laughs> even a 5 10 15 pound weight is gonna help you maintain your muscle and really tone a lot of women complain of extra unintentional weight gain and that's what weights are gonna help you do also picking up weights are going to maintain your bone health, which is super critical when you're menopausal. Osteopenia, osteoporosis, where the bones weaken and can actually fracture, it's a big deal. And so weight-bearing exercises, including picking up some weights, are going to be great. So have you, obviously you have, and doctors have seen the difference. Is it preventable? So let's say in your family you have a history of either osteoporosis or you see some folks in your family who are dealing with those issues. If you start now, can you perhaps avoid the, what feels like inevitable? You might be able to warded off but that is a risk factor having yeah. a family history of it and so paying attention to it early recognizing it early and intervening with weights is definitely going to do you well okay such good advice thank you so much thanks. for talking with us today thanks for having all me. right coming up now we're inspired learn how three friends transformed the way women exercise forever and later tips on how to fuel your body before during and after that workout that we promised to do all that and more just ahead on wellness today our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. NBC News, streaming free now. Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We are back with Women on the Move. For many women, the idea of doing a workout without a good sports bra seems impossible. But in the late 70s, that wasn't the case until three women came together to invent this groundbreaking essential. The jogging craze of the 70s got Lisa Lindahl up and running. But the new exercise made one thing painfully clear. So were you working out one day in college and you said, you know what, this regular bra just isn't working? I had started running. I loved it. It literally changed my life. And the only uncomfortable part about it 
was my bouncing boots, frankly. <laughs> Regular bras just weren't supportive enough for fitness for women with larger chests. So Lisa turned to her childhood friend, Polly Palmer Smith, and her colleague, Hinda Miller, both costume designers, to build a better bra. But they weren't having any luck until Lisa's husband put a jock strap on his chest as a joke. My then husband yeah. came down the stairs and said, hey ladies, here's your jock bra. We thought that was so funny and I, so I took it off of him and pulled it on myself, and I went, Polly, I'm not moving. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Polly took two jock straps and sewed them together, and that design informed the final product, which they called the jog bra. And our goal was to make it a climb-in bra, not no hooks, no straps that would fall off. So that was my mission. While Polly became an Emmy award-winning costume designer, Lisa and Hinda ran the booming jog bra business for more than a decade. It grew because women were demanding products that supported them in their new active life. So it was the one-two punch of Title IX and the sports bra that allowed girls and women to really step up and step into their own power. Um, we have the crisscross straps in the back. Now, the jog bra resides in the National Museum of American History's collections, in part because of the invention's impact on women. It gave them freedom of movement. It allowed them to, you know, do more vigorous exercise. This opened up a lot of areas for them that they didn't feel comfortable in before. But for the inventors of the first sports bra, it's seeing women succeed in sports and embrace fitness that makes them proud. That was the mission of Jog Bra. No matter what your size, shape, or age, every woman and girl deserves the benefits of exercise and fitness. I had the best time talking with Lisa, Hinda, and Polly. By the way, they were inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame for creating the Jog Bra, and you can see it on display at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History starting in 2023. Well deserved. So now that we know how the sports bra was invented, here's the big question for us today. How do we find one that fits? So joining us now is Self Magazine's editor-in-chief, Lita Shy, to share tips on keeping the girls supported. Hi. Hi, Chanel. I just think this is so fantastic. I have to be honest, I was born in 78. You know, the sports bra in my mind has always been. So to right. see these women who actually, you know, started it. Exactly. It's they're, pretty they're cool. the reason why we were able to work out with confidence. Exactly, exactly. Me. All right, so let's talk about why, first of all, it's so important uh, for women to find the right sports bra. Right, so with when it comes to finding the right fit, it's not just about how you feel, but also your confidence level. So I think a really important thing to remember is if we're wearing the right clothes and we're feeling good about what we're what we're working out in, we're gonna have a good workout. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. But also, if you have the wrong fitting bra, it can lead to things like breast pain, which is just not good for anyone, but that can you know lead to kind of some long-term issues. Yeah, you can be fit, sore. You can be sore yeah. during your workouts. Um, fit is okay. really important. So on that note, we have three different mannequins here yes. with some different um, you know things to think about when you're purchasing a sports bra. So with this one, pretty basic, but what do we need to know? So this one, you know, when you're when you're really looking for a sports bra, it's it's important to one, be able to try it out in, in the dressing room if you can, but if you're shopping online, really look for the three types of supports. So okay. Low impact, medium impact, and high impact. And this is a good example of a low impact bra. So, you know, it, it's got um, some straps right here. It's got um, just like, you know, it's keeping you supported, but it's, but not, it's not more like, you know, it's not, it's looking, it's not locked in. in. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're a little heavier chested, you need a little bit more support. Yeah, I didn't realize you could buy one that looks almost like a bra. Yeah, so this is called an encapsulated bra. Um, there's different versus is a, a more compression bra, or because yeah. uh, we don't have one here, but you know, kind of what we would think of the uniboob mm -hmm, look. Mm -hmm. This one is if you if you like to kind of keep your cup separate. Um, it's got some styles in the back where you can you can make it into a racer back. But style is really important when you are searching for a bra because there are so many different types out there mm -hmm. that it's um, you know it can be hard to find the right fit for you. Okay. And I think what's important about 
shopping for a bra is to always put it on, try it, see how it feels, where does it fit on your rib cage? Is it hard to breathe? Is it easy to breathe? Is it too constricting? All of those things are really important. I put on and I just jump. Yeah, you and then I jump. see. Yeah, exactly. See how it goes. Exactly. All right, so last but not least, uh, full disclosure, I told her, I'm like, <laughs> do I want a corset vibe? I but know, you brought up a really good point, though. There's sometimes some vibes going on, right? Yes, <laughs> but sometimes they're hard to get off. So yeah. this takes that away. Exactly. So um, a lot of people, you know, after a workout, you're really sweaty. You don't actually, you know, the, the idea idea of just going like this is, is not so great. So a lot of people really like front front zippers, sure. front clasps, some back clasps. This is a good example of that. And this one is actually really great for people with larger chests. It's a high impact bra, it keeps everything in. You can jump around, you can do a lot of movement. And yeah, like as it goes all the way up. Exactly. You're, you're in there, the girls are in there. Yep. Really quickly, how often should you replace it and, and washing with some of your sports bras? You know what? I'm I, I, I'm I'm not sure how much you how many you should wash it. Probably yeah. every single time you you wear it. But as far um, as the care, hand wash, probably hand wash. Yeah. Put it in a garment bag. Yeah, yeah. Um, as long as you are feeling comfortable in your bra, there's no breast pain. I think okay. you can you can you can keep your bra as long as as you as you like it. Okay, Lita, thank you. Good things to keep in mind. All right, coming up, a registered dietitian breaks down what you should eat to fuel your best workout, and later, a new kind of movement platform that inspires so much more than just a good sweat. Right after this. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. NBC News, streaming free now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to Wellness Today, Women on the Move. Here to teach us a few ways we can use food as our fuel to add a boost to our workouts is registered dietitian Vanessa Rosetto. Thank you for stopping by. Yeah, thanks for having me, so excited. So let's dig in a little bit. First of all, let's talk about three factors that we should all consider when we're planning our meals during the day. Yeah, so three factors we wanna consider are the duration, the intensity, and the time of day. Okay. So if you're going to exercise at five o'clock in the morning, a lot of people don't really feel very great eating right away, yeah, right? Absolutely. It's like, it's hard, right? Because if you're getting up at five, yeah. you're probably gonna work out at like 5.15. So you wanna think about what did you eat the night before? If you're properly fueled from the night before, then you should be fine to sustain your workout. And then after you eat, you probably wanna wait about 20 minutes and you should just have a regular breakfast, protein, fat, carbohydrate. So okay. if we look over here, we can okay. see, right? We have a slice of toast, There's that's a carb. We so this right here would be before a workout. One or the other? You could have after the workout and you could also probably have before if okay. you cho so choose but I would suggest waiting 30 to 60 minutes okay. just because it might not make your stomach feel really great okay so you want to pay attention to that okay. but you could have this slice of toast peanut butter you've got protein you have fat you have carbohydrate mm -hmm. you could also have oatmeal it has exact the exact same thing you just want to think 
if you want to have that extra protein in the oatmeal and you're making the, pro the oatmeal with water, then you would add a peanut butter or maybe So it seems like you need the carbs, protein, and a little bit of fat. Totally. You need it all. Yes. And I think in our minds, a lot of us think, okay, no fat. Right. Or no carbs. Right. You know, we constantly try to figure it out. Right. But if we had them all together, it helps to slow down that digestion and helps keep you full until the next meal. Okay. So you're not constantly looking for the next meal okay. because you're properly fueled. And then 30 to 60 minutes, would you say, before you work out? Yeah, because, you know, moving around, jumping around, yeah, it's a lot. it might make you not feel well. If you're somebody who you're not affected, by all means, have at it, but it okay. just depends on who you are. So let's talk about staying hydrated doing, during a workout. Is just good old-fashioned water not enough, or do you need a little extra oomph? Well, it just depends, right? If I'm training for the New York City Marathon in August, right. New York City in August is very warm, right? Yeah. So I would need more than just water. But what about just the average Joe watching this morning? Or I'm, not Joe. Or, well, you can be a Joe, too. Yeah. Or Julia. So <laughs> how, how hydrated are you? Are okay. you somebody who drinks alcohol at night? Mm -hmm. You might be more dehydrated. Do you did you have coffee? So you want to be paying attention to that. What so, are these things? Right. So we've got water here is fine. Yeah. These. You could also have powdered electrolyte water or just a noon tablet. Okay. And What's also, that? I don't even know what that is. A noon tablet, is, again, is electrolyte. So okay. it's just going to help you stay more hydrated. Okay. And if you don't want to spend money or have these things in your house, good old-fashioned table salt will do the same trick. Really? Yes. Will, what, in your water? Yeah, in your water. Just a little bit? Just a little bit, just a pinch. It's going to help you with hydration. It's going to help your muscles. So you don't have to go through this exercise of, of spending extra cash yeah. on, on a, an electrolyte water. Learn something every day. Yeah. All right, let's talk about after your workout. I asked her, full disclosure, if it's true after you work out, if you eat a meal, like your body's like burning it. <laughs> she said, no, that's not true. <laughs> so talk about what we should eat after a workout. Yeah, so like, okay, here's the thing. When you exercise, your muscles are depleted of glycogen, which is their energy store. So you want to make sure that you definitely have eaten something so that you're not using all the, the muscles that you've been building. So that that makes sense. But how are ways for you to replenish and recover? So we have blueberries here. That's like the best recovery. Um, and also- Why you, is that? It's just because the um, antioxidants help with the muscles. Okay. So muscle, you know, runners do sure. this, cyclists. And then you want to add some cheese to it because there's protein there. So it's going to help spare your muscles. And then also a really good recovery drink, the best recovery drink is chocolate milk. It has electrolytes. It has calcium. It has magnesium. It has phosphorus. So again, it helps with your hydration. It helps keep your muscles boosted. And also it's going to help you feel full. You know what? It's so funny because we've been trained, and it's not right, but to think chocolate milk or cheese, like some of these things are bad, but it just goes to show. Yeah. yeah. No, we don't have to omit any food, and yeah. we don't need to vilify these yeah. foods. If yeah. they work for you, you should definitely have them, and it also makes things like different and exciting. So think about if you had worked out maybe in the middle of the day and it's you know not quite ready for lunch, you could have a chocolate milk as a snack, and that's yeah. going to feel good, and you're not going to feel so hungry and yeah. peckish maybe later on at night. What's your thought on counting calories, or calories in versus calories out? Not all calories are created equal. Sure. If you want to think about 96 calories of beer versus 96 calories of chicken are going to be digested entirely different way. Okay. So calories in, calories out is very like old, but nutrition is a new science. We yeah. only started studying it maybe like 80 years ago. Yeah. So we're still always learning. And that was something that we thought was true, you know, in the mid 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. 70s. But now we know that's not entirely the story. Mm -hmm. So I don't think counting calories is the way, but really making sure that you have protein, fat, and carb at every meal is going to help you stay full. And then you don't have to be so hyper-focused on the calorie. But what does the makeup of the plate look like? Mm -hmm. Do you have fiber? Do you have fat? Are you enjoying your food? Mm -hmm. Those are things that that are going to help you in the long run not overeat or binge later on in the day. It almost too sounds like it, look, this whole show is about health and wellness. Just being mindful yeah. of what you're putting in, even yeah. with these things, like even before you work out, like all of these things, it's well thought out. But you see all of the groups here. Totally. Yeah. And also, yeah. like, what's right for you is not right for me. Yeah. There's so many factors. Vanessa Rosetto, thank you thank so you. much. All right, when we come back, actor Allison Stoner's new fitness platform that will inspire all of us to get moving right here on Wellness Today. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now.
NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. you got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Women on the Move. You may recognize Allison Stoner from her roles in Step Up and Cheaper by the Dozen. Now her latest project with her sister Corey O'Neill is disrupting the wellness space with movement classes to help improve not only physical health, but emotional and mental well-being too. I got a chance to sit down with them to learn more about Movement Genius and an inclusive and empowering platform. Take a look. And starting with your feet, go ahead and tighten the muscles in your feet by curling your toes downward. And now exhale and suddenly release all the tension completely. <sighs> so we are currently at the annual Youth Wellness Summit with the Society for the Prevention of Teen Suicide. And Movement Genius is teaching students some different stress relief techniques that they can use to support their mental health. We first built Movement Genius thinking this would be for young people but really this is for everyone with a body. Historically, wellness has been built by and for a very narrow set of bodies. So right off the bat, we wanted to make sure that we're collaborating with practitioners and experts who embody all lived experiences, all kinds of body types, preferences, needs, so that you can see wellness for everyone. Just like your mind, your body is remembering all of your experiences every day. The high moments, the low moments. It's interesting though, because when I think about mental health, I don't know if I connect it with the body, you think neck up. Where is stress, anxiety, and even trauma stored? In the body, in the muscles, in your cells, in these learned behaviors and responses to different situations. So mindful movement allows you to reconnect your mind and body, learn how your body needs to relax and release tension. This isn't a new practice per se, but it's never been presented in an entertaining format. If you're releasing a bunch of stress hormones and adrenaline, shaking it out actually helps you release that adrenaline and then you can come down to a state of calmness. So you've heard of fight, flight, or freeze, Absolutely. or stress and threat yeah. response. Now, what happens after that threat is done? What do you normally do? I don't really run. Maybe I freeze? I don't know. So once we freeze, have you ever seen an animal in a moment of threat? Do you recognize what they do after that threat has no, passed? No, I've never really thought about it. After a moment of threat, we'll kind of just shake it off and then keep moving forward and shake out shake some of the stress. So it's not just fun, it actually, there's science it behind works. it. There is science behind it. We're just reminding you of the intelligence that your body has to cope with stress and feel better. You'll see me doing this tomorrow before yes. the show and you're like, what is she doing? Exactly. Movement Genius is committed to making their wellness classes accessible to everybody. Most memberships cost no more than $10 a month. Thank you for joining me to celebrate how women have transformed their lives through exercise. We've seen how breaking a sweat is essential for our mental, physical, and emotional well-being at all stages of our lives. I am feeling ready, and I hope you are too, to find the fitness routine that makes you feel your best every single day. I'm Chanel Jones, and we'll see you next time on Wellness Today. Just go. Today Show's newest fan. Little Al Roker. What are you doing here? What am I doing here?
There are dozens of Chinatowns all across America with interesting architecture, diverse restaurants and specialty shops. It's no wonder they're popular with locals and tourists alike. They also provide places for new immigrants and for families to create communities. But with gentrification and all sorts of problems from the pandemic, it's no wonder that all these Chinatowns are rapidly changing. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Okay, so it's no surprise. There's incredible food to be found here in Manhattan's Chinatown, folks lining up all the time. But there used to be Chinatowns in cities and towns, big and small, all across this country. In fact, the longest running family-owned Chinese restaurant is in a place you might never think of, Butte, Montana. At the turn of the century, Butte, Montana was a bustling mining town. The invention of electricity leading to a demand for conductors like copper. Mining boomed, the city flourishing. The demand for labor brought thousands of immigrants to Butte. They came from so many different countries, including Italy, Ireland, and China. It was the classic portrait of the American West, with gambling, saloons, even a red light district. By 1914, Butte's Chinatown was thriving with over 60 Chinese-owned businesses. Now we're gonna prepare broccoli beef. My name is Jerry Tam, and I'm the owner of the Pekin Noodle Parlor. The Pekin first opened as a tobacco shop and casino run by Jerry's great uncle, Hum Yao. Two years later, Hum adding a restaurant and the Pekin Noodle Parlor was born. Well, this building has three different levels. The top level obviously is the Pekin Noodle Parlor. And then the second level on the main street used to be a herbal medicine shop. That shop was run by Jerry's great grandfather, Tam Kuang Yi. And it's crazy to think that, you know, everything came over from China at one time. Like they didn't make soy sauce in America. The noodles were fried and brought over on ships because they didn't make fresh noodles. So the history of this place really holds true that this is a Chinese restaurant, you know, from Chinese immigrants. I met up with culinary historian Grace Young to learn more about America's earliest Chinatown. Where was the first Chinatown and how did it get started? The first Chinatown is San Francisco. The first Chinese came to California uh, for the gold rush and that was 1848. And uh, they came because America needed cheap labor. And so from gold rush, they ended up doing farming, mm. manufacturing, and then eventually they worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. And the first Chinatown formed because America wanted cheap labor, but they didn't want the Chinese to live with whites. So they were ostracized from white communities. So t talk to me about that first wave of, of Chinese immigration to the U.S. The Chinese came from southern China, from principally from the area of Canton, and there was tremendous prejudice against mm -hmm. the Chinese. They were lynched, and because the Chinese were willing to work for lower wages, they were seen as the reason why Americans were suffering so much. So the blame mm -hmm. was unfairly placed on the Chinese. In 1882, Congress signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law. It banned Chinese from migrating to the U.S. It marks the only time in American history that an entire race or ethnic group was banned from immigrating. But the interesting thing about this Exclusion Act was that there was actually exemption for Chinese tourists, students, teachers, and also merchants. A landmark court case in 1915 classified Chinese restaurant owners as merchants. And it gave them a way to circumvent the Exclusion Act of 1882. It was this exemption that allowed Jerry's great uncle to open Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, paving a path for more family members to immigrate to the U.S. and help the business. Jerry's father, Danny Wong, 
arrived in the U.S. in 1947 as a teenager. Ever since he was 14 years old, he's been working at the Pika Noodle Parlor, and he just started with the simple roles of washing dishes, and then he learned how to cook, and then he slowly just started integrating himself into you know, managing it and working with the waitresses and the staff. Danny taking over the restaurant in the 1950s, spending years turning it into a pillar of the local community. Well, I've been coming here for at least 50 years, and they give me plenty of food. I never walk away hungry. I love coming to work because of all the people I work with. Like, they choose really nice people. And I mean, my father probably employed over 10,000 people at this, you know, throughout his whole entire life. So it's interesting to know that there's nearly five to six generations of people that, you know, have worked here. The menu at Pekin Noodle Parlor hasn't changed much over the years. We do a thing called chop suey. And what chop suey is, is tidbits of leftover uh, vegetables that were kind of mixed together in its own gravy and served on top of chow mein noodles. We've been serving it for over 110 years. Chop suey is in large part why Chinese food became so popular across the United States. Chop suey was the first time America experienced a culinary craze, a food craze. Mm -hmm. And it's starting at the end of the 19th century that there are Americans who are venturing into Chinatown. The way they got them to even experiment with Chinese food was to make a stir fry that was actually quite bland. Mm -hmm. So they used bamboo shoots, water chestnuts, onions, uh, oftentimes there was celery. For many years, Chinatowns were the only places where non-Chinese Americans could sample Asian flavors. Americans were going into Chinatown, some were curious, they wanted to experience curio shops, Chinese operas. With increased tourism, Chinatowns and large cities grew. But it was a different story in Montana. Like many mining towns, Butte lost many of its workers as production slowed in the 1950s. Once the copper ran dry, then the people just started to pick up and just kind of move on, move on and move back to their families and the bigger states. As miners left Butte for new opportunities, its Chinatown disappeared. In the early 1900s, there were seven chop suey restaurants listed in the Butte City Directory. Today, only the Pekin Noodle Parlor remains open. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now, we're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. Still in Kiev. Could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. good. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. Jerry Tam runs the Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, Montana. People may know this is the oldest Chinese restaurant in America, but below it is so much history. Despite Pekin's historic status, Jerry says he was never pressured by family to join the business. I never learned to cook until I came back, uh, back in around 2009, because like any Asian American, my parents wanted all of their kids to go to college, so we all went to colleges around the nation and to get a better education, to become a lawyer, a doctor, and what have you. But I went into fashion, and what was great about that is I got to see the world because of it. In 2004, 
Jerry even appearing on Bravo's Project Runway. But a few years later, family duty calling him home. And unfortunately, my mom had a stroke, so my dad needed help, you know, taking care of her and taking care of the restaurant. I think it was really hard on my father because they were in a generation where they loved each other every day. And they were just best friends. After Jerry's mom passed, Jerry and his dad began operating Pekin together. He never stopped working, so he was working here all the way until 85, until he couldn't make up the stairs anymore. My father and I spent every day together. I made sure he was, uh, he was healthy all the way till the end, the best of my ability I can do. My, my father passed in November, and it was really, you know, heartbreaking. He didn't want to say goodbye to my sisters or me or this restaurant or the community. He loved you, Montana. Jerry now runs Pekin Noodle Parlor with his cousin, Nelson. Together, they're working to preserve a family legacy and keep a piece of Chinese American history alive in an unlikely place. I've been asked the question, what is the future of the Pekin? And the best answer I can give you is, let's just keep it the same. Let's not change anything, because that's what people come here for. They have their parking spots, they have their booths, they have their favorite place to sit at the bar. I don't think they want any change, because this is a place that feels like home. Well, maybe Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia, could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. NBC News. Streaming free now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. While New York City is home to America's largest Chinatown, the honor of the oldest goes to San Francisco. And that's where the Far East Cafe is located. It is one of the last remaining historic Chinese banquet halls. After a two-year hiatus, this celebrated venue hosted the 64th annual Miss Chinatown USA pageant, a Lunar New Year tradition. The occasion marking a triumphant milestone for this century-old institution. Bill Lee has owned the Far East Cafe since 1999. His daughter Kathy working by his side as the manager. He brought me into the restaurant to kind of understand the roots of our culture. He wanted me to remember that, you know, Chinatown is about community, is about traditions, is about culture. For many in the community, Chinese banquet halls are more than just venues for special events. I feel that Far East is kind of like a second home for, you know, a lot of our patrons that come in because they feel so comfortable so much history and so many memories, you know, 
A lot of patrons that have been here, they told me, they're like, oh, my parents had my red egg ginger party. It's very similar to like a baptism. And that was like 50 something years ago. And that history is everywhere you look at Far East. The ceilings, the, like my dad mentioned, the high ceilings, the moldings, the moldings are all original. And the lanterns were all imported from China uh, in the 1920s. So they're over 100 plus years old. For the last few decades, there were five giant banquet style restaurants in San Francisco's Chinatown. But with rising rents and gentrification, most have since closed their doors. By early 2020, only two banquet halls remained. The Far East Cafe planned to celebrate its 100 year anniversary with a big celebration. Instead, it's now planning to close its doors. At the start of the pandemic, the restaurant stayed afloat by cooking meals for senior citizens and low income residents in Chinatown. We applied for a PPP loan and we got over $200,000. We also received money from the feed and fuel program. Then our landlord gave us six months of free rent. Beyond COVID, a different type of virus brought more harm to Chinatowns across the country. Anti-Asian hate crimes soaring by nearly 340% in 2021. When this started happening, I felt very, very sad and also very angry because I'm like, why is this happening to Chinatown? Why is it happening to our community? You know, for these people to target elderly people, to push them down, to rob them, don't they realize that they have grandparents too, or they have parents that are that age? And if that happened to their parents, how would they feel? Then People saw the attacks when they watched the news and heard reports, and they got even more scared. They don't want to go out, even for special events like the Mid-Autumn Festival. We tried to invite them, but they didn't want to come. We used to be open until 10 o'clock before pandemic. Sometimes we would stay out here until midnight if we had events. Now, we can't. We can't do that. We changed the business hours to close at 7, 7.30, because safety is the most important thing. Business owners across Chinatown still face hostility. George and Cindy Chen opened China Live in 2017. We've been lucky. Uh, we've only had a couple instances where, you know, people scream uh, anti-Asian slurs. And we're concerned about our employees, you know, coming to work and, and being harassed. I, I think that ignorance is uh, very unfortunate. China Live is a massive marketplace with multiple restaurants. It's in a building that once housed a banquet hall like Far East. I remember coming to a wedding here when I was in college, and there were, I think, I think literally 5,000 people in like six restaurants. But unfortunately, you know, real estate was getting very expensive, so it's not very cost effective if you don't have that business. But two years ago, the couple had to lay off 200 workers. However, with the support of partners, George and Cindy were able to pivot their business on a few fronts. We did, you know, the ghost kitchen was selling outside our box. So we have 10 locations in the Bay Area, from San Jose to Berkeley, and, uh, and they can order food from those ghost kitchens. Ghost kitchens prepare restaurant quality food exclusively for delivery or takeout. We sold so many Peking ducks, we didn't know what to do with all the duck fat. So what do you do? You make popcorn with it. So that's why we have a duck fat popcorn. As business picked up, China Live was able to rehire 100 workers. Despite an uncertain future, these restaurants remain hopeful that business will rebound. More police presence, People are more, as a community, standing up for ourselves, making sure that we have like the buddy system, making sure that we're together and we feel safe, that we're walking together, that we have each other's back. I mean, dining out is an essential part of life, right? I mean, one more fun is to look forward to having dinner with friends you haven't seen at a new place or a old favorite place. But some old favorites just can't be replaced. During the pandemic, many restaurants have shut down. Far East is now the biggest restaurant in Chinatown. 
If Far East closes, there won't be space big enough to host large events for the community. We were overjoyed having that Miss Chinatown USA event here, a press conference, and just being able to reconnect with the community. It warmed my heart. And my dad was just like so overjoyed that people were coming in just to celebrate. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Ali Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Ali Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To learn more about the future of Chinese-American restaurants, I went to visit Chef Lucas Sin in New York City. This savvy chef is on a mission to save mom and pop shops from closing and putting a spin on the classics. Hey, nice oh, to meet good you. To see you. All right, can't wait to yeah, talk come in, and taste. Come in, come in here, come in here. Lucas was born and raised in Hong Kong. Growing up, he had never heard of dishes like General Tso's chicken. What was your first experience with Chinese American food? Yeah. And did you go, what the heck is this? I was here for summer camp, and uh, on Tuesdays, at 10 o'clock or so, right before bedtime, this van would pull up in the front of the school, um, and you could pick between sesame chicken, general Tso's chicken, orange chicken with broccoli and fried rice or white rice or whatever it was. The first thought was that this is ridiculously delicious, where has this been my whole life? And the second thought is that what in the world is the difference between orange chicken and general Tso's chicken and sesame chicken? Why is there so much that I don't understand about this if last time I checked I was Chinese? Lucas actually studying cognitive science at Yale, but he always had a passion for cooking. His summers spent training in award-winning restaurants in Hong Kong and Japan. After graduating in 2015, Lucas opened his first restaurant with Yale classmate Yang Zhao. Junzi Kitchen is a fast casual chain that serves modern Chinese fare. But Lucas remained passionate about the Chinese American cuisine he first tasted as a boy. So, so how did Chinese American food, the food that we have become uh, familiar with, how did that develop? How yeah. did that happen? Now, Chinese takeout is interesting, right? Because it's all over the United States. Right? So these folks come in, they yeah. Yeah. apprentice in a restaurant, right. they learn those recipes, and they then go move somewhere on else, right? To open their own exactly. restaurant. Exactly. And then their cousins come from Fujian, and then those recipes are passed on. And there's a remarkable similarity to, to, to these dishes. Despite the popularity of Chinese-American food, many family-owned restaurants that once dotted Chinatowns and other urban areas have been closing for years. Opening restaurants is really difficult, and running restaurants is perhaps even more difficult. These moms and dads open these restaurants so that their kids can go to university and become lawyers and doctors and television hosts and whatnot. And now that they're finally able to do that, they don't need to run these restaurants anymore, right? The li suddenly, livelihoods have changed. That's a good thing. Lucas and Young hatched an idea to help smaller businesses in 2019. Nice Day seeks out restaurants facing closure, then works with the owners to remodel the space and update the menus. The pandemic stalled the team's initial plans, 
but the second location in Long Island is slated to open this spring. It's important to me that these new Chinese American takeout restaurants that we're building called Nice Day work with the previous generation of owners because they have a lot of knowledge that mm -hmm. we don't. They know their customers, they know what sells, um, they know how to cook these dishes, they have recipes. You raise an interesting point, Lucas, mm -hmm. in that you talk to these retired mm -hmm. Chinese restaurant owners. I is that part of the, the, the sense of trying to memorialize mm -hmm. what could be lost? Now, preserving recipes is part of it. But the other important part is preserving the way business is done. Chinese takeout restaurants are one of the few restaurants in the world that if they're open from, let's say, 11 to 10, the work hours are 11 to 10. They don't have any prep hours. The same cooks that do the walk stir fries are also prepping during the day. It's ridiculously efficient, and it's got to do with the setup and the way that the kitchens are run. But it's also important to us that we give back to this last generation and that we can make sure that owners who want to retire can retire well and that that legacy can be preserved in a new type of American Chinese takeout restaurant. While Nice Day pays homage to popular Chinese American recipes, Lucas has been celebrated for his innovative fusion dishes. In 2021, he was named one of Food and Wine's best new chefs. We serve a Mapo mac and cheese yeah. here, which yeah. is a variation on that dish. It's fusiony and it's silly and it's just an attempt to do something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it betrays every chef sensibility that I have, but unfortunately it's delicious and it's interesting and it gets people talking. Finally, it's time to eat. Lucas showing me how to make his signature dish. How do we get started? So the mapo mac and cheese, the mac and the cheese elements are rigorously American. Mm -hmm. These are, this is elbow macaroni right. uh, cooked halfway and this is Velveeta. Um, but the mapo element is going to be in the form of a mapo sauce, if you will. The last two elements that really sort of take this over the edge is um, Chinese sausage. Oh. It, it can function like bacon and some dried shiitake mushrooms that we've rehydrated. So um, to start off with, we're just gonna cut a couple of things. And this tofu, we will then put into the deep fryer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This concludes the chopping portion of our program. <laughs> Next, garlic and ginger are cooked till fragrant. Then, spicy bean paste and soybean paste are added to start the sauce. Mushroom broth is added, the mixture brought to a boil so the flavors infuse. Can I give that a try? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's here you go. So your left hand's on the walk? Yeah. Yes. I can't, I, can't, I can't get any altitude on this thing. Nothing's coming up. And that's why the pros do it, baby. At this point, everything's smelling quite good. Uh -huh. So the macaroni is going to go in, as well as the soup we just made. Once it's boiling and happy, two slices are the best of the best. Velveeta. Velveeta American cheese. Wait for that Velveeta to melt. Uh -huh. You'll see that that sauce is already beautifully tied together. We like to play this dish in the Chinese takeout box. Oh, wow. Because it's silly. Oh, um, why not? <laughs> it's fun. Boom. Some fried tofu puffs as croutons go over the top. That's a little bit of texture and the homage to the original Mapo tofu. These fresh scallions are actually really important because they cut through the heaviness mm -hmm. of the original dish. Wow. Just a little spice, the creaminess, the crunch of the, the tofu. I hope you get, yeah, get a little, little bit of the Chinese sausage. sausage, yeah. Whoa. You've never had mac and cheese like this. <laughs> <laughs> Amid a global pandemic, changing family dynamics, and anti-Asian racism, Chinatowns across America and the communities that sustain them face a challenging road ahead. Every business that is open right now is still fighting for its life. And I think that the best way to fight the anti-Asian hate is to show our love for the community. Come to Chinatown or your local Asian American Pacific Islander restaurant, store, market. Give them your business.
We have lost so much during the pandemic and I think it makes us all so much more conscious that we have to protect what we love. Hello and thanks for joining us for Consumer Confidential. I'm Vicki Wynn. We are inching towards summer and that means it's time to start planning that summer getaway and you won't be alone. The TSA says airline passenger numbers are soaring almost back to pre-pandemic levels with more than 2 million flyers on most days. But be prepared to pay up. The surge in demand and rising oil prices have pushed airfares up 40% since January. According to AAA, the average cost for a regular gallon of gas is $4.12. Compare that to a year ago when it was $2.89 for a gallon. And rising food costs are also taking a piece out of our budgets. The average household now spends about $327 more per month to cover the soaring costs of everyday necessities from gas to groceries. But no need to let inflation stop your family vacation, according to financial expert Winnie Sun. You know, you want to look at, there's still areas where you can go to, drive to, and perhaps just don't get on a plane since, you know, airline prices continue to get higher. But do you know, if you do a little smart planning with points and miles, there's a lot that you can do without really breaking your budget. That's why for the next 25 minutes, we're going to help you get through it. From amusement park hacks to whether you should fly or drive, we'll even talk about what it's like to take a cruise these days. But first, to guide us through the state of travel, Samantha Brown. She has traversed the world for decades. She joins us now with what we need to know about traveling. It is such a pleasure to have you here. It is great to be here. Thank Let's talk travel. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's something you know a lot about. Mm -hmm. So after two years of us being cooped up, I know I'm absolutely ready to get out, see some sites. You're on the road all the time. Let's start just with masking. What are you yeah. seeing from that perspective? What's the latest on the guidelines? Planes, trains, buses. So planes, obviously we know on public transportation and even planes, a mask mandate has ended mm -hmm. for passengers as well as crew, but not airports. Airports get to dictate what they want. So yeah. right now we're even seeing like JFK, New York, LAX, Los Angeles, they're not dropping their mask mandates. Even stores will see signs up, we prefer that you wear a mask. Right. So my advice is bring masks. You may need them, you may want them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What about the idea that there's just so many places in the world to go? Where are you seeing people gravitating to the most? Oh, gosh, the United States of America. You know, we began it in 2020 and people just just continually dial down on our amazing country, mm -hmm. especially, of course, Americans. So the entire eastern seaboard, the west coast, Colorado is a massive hot destination. Really, the only destinations that aren't hot right now, Vicki, are major cities. Oh, um, you know, for the leisure traveler, they just have and come back major cities get international travelers a lot of business travelers and that travel has not yet returned okay we know every good trip starts with planning right so what's the best way to set a destination and sort of plan out an itinerary so you can have a successful trip and a good time so I love this because I talk to a lot of moms out there we're the travel planners mm -hmm. right right now what's dictating where people are going is simply can we afford it yeah. right the affordability and these walls are now closing in especially for summer so a great tactic is to sign up for cheap fare alerts I I love websites like airfarewatchdog.com, skyscanner.com. I sign up for an alert, I plug in my departing airport, and then every single week, and sometimes three weeks, if, uh, every three, three weeks, three times a week, sorry, I am sent the cheapest departures leaving from oh. my airport. So now I have a whole nice. list, Vicki, that I can work from that Based is on budget and available. Oh, I love that. Okay, that's a really great hack. I want to say, full disclosure, my parents and I, we are Samantha Brown super fans. <laughs> like, my mom actually owns your luggage. The bag nice. with the, like, the little carry-on yep. attached together. It's my system. Yep. We have loved you and followed you for years, and you're such an expert here. So let's talk about what are your hacks for packing and, and making sure you don't leave anything behind and that it's hassle-free. Okay, so my best travel pa packing hack right now, bring old shoes. All oh. your old sneakers, never throw those away or even donate. Bring them, pack them, use them, then leave them at your destination. Oh my gosh. Shoes take up way too much room in your luggage. Now you've got space back to bring things from your travel. So that's my number one packing hack. For being prepared for the airport or any type of travel, food. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know road trips, everyone brings food, but yes. even for the airport, I'm seeing very, very long lines yes. for restaurants, for food. Maybe you can't sit down and get a meal and that plane doesn't feed you anymore. Right. We know that if our kids don't eat and if moms don't eat, 
all it's it's over. Everybody's right? super Every, angry. It's so not fun. Bring a picnic lunch is what I say to the airport. Pack food. That is so smart. The old shoes, fascinating. Old shoes. Just don't take pictures from like you know. <laughs> exactly. Don't no show the old shoes in the photos. Exactly. I love it. Okay. Well, we know the airlines have been struggling sort of to get back to normal. Staffing levels are low. We're seeing a lot of yes. cancellations. You add on the crazy weather, and people are getting stranded at airports. Are there things that we can do ahead of our trip so that we don't end up in that kind of situation? Well, you can't really avoid canceled flights. No one has that crystal ball, mm -hmm. but there are flights that tend to leave better than others, uh -huh. and that is your first flight out. Okay. That 6 a.m. flight, 6.30 a.m. flight, mm -hmm. it is so painful getting up at 3.30 and 4 a.m., but it is absolutely worth it. Those planes okay. leave. Why? Because that plane has come in the night before, okay. so you already have your plane, you hopefully have the crew, mm -hmm. and you depart before all the weather, all the other delays, all delays happening on the East Coast or the West Coast meets the East Coast happen. You are en route. And those are now the, still the cheapest flights to get. They may okay. still have availability on those 6 a.m. flights. So you're doing well. If you get a uh, first flight out and direct, you're doing good with travel. You just got to wake up the kids and wake get them up. on board. My kids would always go in their pajamas. They oh. loved it. Just roll out of bed, put on the shoes, the old sneakers. The old sneakers <laughs> that we're going to leave behind. We're going to leave behind and have you know, replacements. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Genius. Okay, so <laughs> with so much happening right now, do you think people should invest extra in travel insurance? I mean, it's so expensive to travel to begin with, but is it worth it to get that extra insurance? Well, it depends. I think if you're spending a lot of money and people are making these really big once-in-a-lifetime trips because they haven't been able to travel for years, they're bringing their parents, their kids, that's a lot of money. So the way I look at it as, this is an investment and travel insurance protects that investment if it's a lot of money. If you are going overseas, absolutely, okay. especially get medical coverage. Right. Understand that our own health insurance here in the United cool. States provides little to no coverage overseas. Mm -hmm. You will want that. And so it's just, again, protecting your investment, looking forward to the trip, and knowing you're you're in good hands if, so, if something goes wrong. I could talk to you forever. I know. So Let's do it. Only, Samantha <laughs> Brown, thank you so much. Well, now that we've gotten all those great tips for how to plan and carry out a vacation, what about whether you should fly or drive? Questions you want to ask before you head out. Plus, RVing is more popular than ever. But trust me, it is definitely not like driving a regular car. Hit the road with me as I go to RV school for a driving lesson and later on amusement parks. Big time, hot destination right now. The secrets to saving money and packing it all in. Much more when Consumer Confidential returns. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking down. Yeah. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. If you're planning on hitting the road this summer, finding ways to save some money is always welcome news, especially with record high gas prices. As we talked about earlier, AAA says the average cost for a regular gallon of gas is $4.12. That's actually up more than 40% from just a year ago. Joining us now is Paula Twydale. She's a senior vice president for travel at AAA. She's going to help us navigate our summer road trip. Paula, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. So gas prices at these record levels, we haven't seen them like this before 
are. It's really hurting all of us in our pocketbook. What are some ways that you can save if you're planning to do a road trip this summer? Well, anyone that's planning a road trip or wherever they're going, we say plan early. Mm -hmm. uh, planning is critical. Knowing the distances you're going, look at times, mm -hmm. tolls if you're on the road, stops that you may want to make, and, and certainly what you're going to spend. And AAA has talked about filling up at the beginning of the week. It can be cheaper in different locations like you want to find in town versus right off the freeway. That can be a way to save money as well. What about if you are on the fence between flying and driving? You know, you're not just thinking about the price of the plane ticket, right? What are some other things to consider and factor into your budget? Sure, great question. Really, it's about doing the math. Mm. You have to figure out what is the distance I'm going to travel? How much discretionary time do I have to plan my vacation? So do you want to be spending your time on the road at the front end of your vacation, the back end driving if it's maybe 8 or 12 or hours of the day? Uh, so the distance comes into play and really how many people are traveling. So if two people, yourself and a significant other, are going to travel, you may want to fly because mm -hmm. you can afford that plane ticket when you're planning early to get the best rate. However, if you're going to drive, you, you might be losing those 12 or 15 hours in the car right. and you're going to plan on stops and any ancillary costs that you may incur if you're going to overnight in a hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, and understanding too, there are parking fees that come yeah. into play. So what's happening when you get to that hotel and you incur parking fees? Let's talk about rentals and car rentals because there's major sticker shock out there. We were planning a trip to the West Coast and thought we would just rent a car and instead decided, you know what, it makes more sense to take a ride share like an Uber or a Lyft from the airport to our destination because we don't really need a car for the whole time that we're traveling. So what do people need to know on different ways to save on car rentals or maybe not even renting a car? Well, first of all, knowing the personal circumstances, right? If you're in a resort area or with family, you may not need a rental mm -hmm. car when you get to your destination. But if you do, uh, you would want to really consider the off-airport locations as well in the local area in the community. They're usually less expensive, number one, okay. uh, because they're not paying those airport taxes. Right. right? So that's first. So ride you get to the airport and then you take a ride share to an off-airport location yes, to pick up a car. And sometimes the locations have pickup services oh, too. Okay. So weigh those differences out and, and maybe you're going to rent a car. But the in the case of yourself where you're going to be staying and attractions or restaurants or things are all in walking distance, you're not going to really need to rent a car. A ride share is a good option. Mm -hmm. But if you do need to rent a car, do it ahead of time. Uh, plan so that you have the inventory available, making sure you have the selection of the price. And if you have an option, pay in advance because mm -hmm. you can save about 20% off your bill. Oh. I've seen a $100 difference between pay now at time of booking versus pay at the counter. Oh, so that's you real have money. more choice because there will be shortages this year. More people are traveling this summer. 50 52% of Americans have already made their plans for the summer. Great advice. Thank you so much for coming in and joining us, Thank Paula. you so much. Well, speaking of hitting the road, RVing really became popular during the pandemic. And if you are thinking about going on your own cross-country adventure, just remember driving an RV, it is not like driving a car. They are big, they're heavy, and if you don't know what you're doing, they can be dangerous. To show you what to expect, I went to driving school. Time to hit the open road. And with a recreational vehicle, it's a comfortable and even luxurious way to see the country. RVs are so popular right now, one major rental company reports sales are up 38% from the previous year. But some RVs are more than 40 feet long, 13 feet tall, and weigh more than 40,000 pounds, making them even bigger and heavier than a school bus. And that's why they say before you drive one of these recreational vehicles, you need some specialty training. That's what I'm doing here in Texas in this parking lot where they've set up these orange cones and a little driving course. And you know what? I'm going to crush it. My instructor, Tim Armstrong, with the RV Driving School. He has 25 years of experience as a professional semi-truck driver and RV instructor. Our vehicle, this massive motorhome that sleeps four, has a full kitchen, bathroom, and even a washer and dryer. A true home away from home, loaned to us by the National Indoor RV Centers. So before we get behind the wheel, what do we have to do? We're going to do a safety check. Okay. We're going to walk around, make sure all our hatches are closed. We have air in the tires. There's nothing underneath that could cause us a problem. And check the front and the back to make sure those areas are clear. Time to get into the driver's seat. But first, a minor wardrobe change. You had me change out of my flip-flops to wear these shoes. Why was that important? We always want a solid shoe to drive because I want you to have a firm 
control of the brake and the gas. Okay, here we go. Next, I get situated. Before we can drive, we have to have everything set up for you. That means adjust the seat so you can reach the pedals and see above the dashboard. Make sure you can reach the steering wheel and your arms are relaxed. And fine tune the all important mirrors so you can see what's beside you while you're turning. Mirrors and these size coaches, mm -hmm. that's your very best friend. We are all adjusted. How do I put this thing into gear? First off, put your foot on the brake. Got it. On the left side, there's a little panel that says DNR. Press D for drive. That yellow knob up on the dash, that is your parking brake. Push the brake? Yep. Ooh, that, that is fine. Finally, we're ready to roll. I'm just gonna move a couple inches and then grab on with the brakes. That's air brakes, so okay. they, they tend to grab a little quicker. Yeah, they do. Tim says those brakes are sensitive for a reason. Vehicles this size need 450 feet to come to a full stop from highway speeds. A lot of weight you're trying to bring to a stop. Now that I know how to stop it, I learned how to park it, which was harder than I thought. Whoops, we're going backwards and we should be going forwards. I've drifted way over. I feel like I'm gonna run over that cone. Fortunately, I only took out a few parking cones. And run over those front ones? Oh, yeah, they're gone. But soon I straighten it out. Look at that, right this. down the cone. Bam! Oh, yeah. Relying on my mirrors and backup camera to ease into my parking spaces. Get the hang of it. Boom. Done. Tim says most crashes occur at less than five miles an hour while parking, which is why you should leave a buffer from the curb. And he says beginners should get out of the vehicle to double check. So we look here, we've got three feet of clearance yet. The way yours is set up, you're perfect. Now for the real test, the driving course. Boy, this thing is very different from driving a car. Holy smokes. And on my very first turn, I hopped the curb. Okay. Watch oh, out. wow, what watch was that? that little mirror. Now watch from our GoPro mounted on the RV. Oops. While I did hit a few bumps, whoa, whoa, whoa. The curb again. I found that curb. I finally turned a corner. There you go, turning okay. quickly. You got it. Oh, yeah. I learned my lesson. Cruising in an RV can be a great way to see the country, but only with the proper training. Oops. All right, well, driving the RV was fun, but it was exhausting. It really took total concentration. The RV Driving School charges $590 for individual two-day lessons. What you just watched was mostly what's covered in the first day. Some of the lessons we didn't go over, how to enter and exit an off-ramp, how to stop at high speeds, how to get through those toll booths, and also, don't forget, pumping your gas. That's even different with an RV, and it certainly emphasizes why this kind of training is important if you're going to get behind the wheel of a large, heavy vehicle. All right, so are you ready to go cruising? A look at what you need to know before you hit the high seas and later learn the tricks of the trade to make the most out of your next visit to an amusement park. From the must-do rides and foods to try, corn dog and Dole Whip, obvi, to tips to save you money, you are watching Consumer Confidential. Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. 
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. good. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. If you wanted to set sail over the past two years, you know it was nearly impossible. The cruise industry was hit hard by COVID challenges. But get your flip-flops and swimsuits ready. Cruise lines are making a big comeback. They're promising a safe experience for travelers, and demand is through the roof. Here to tell us what to expect is Colleen McDaniel. She's the editor-in-chief of Cruise Critic. Colleen, welcome. Thanks so much. First, let's talk about what do people need to know about cruise travel right now in the pandemic? What are the safety precautions that are being taken? You bet. So really over the past two years, uh, the cruise industry has made a slow comeback. Um, in the first year, there wasn't really a whole lot in the way of cruising. But since about a year ago, it's really made the comeback. There isn't really a general protocol in place that all the cruise lines share, but you can count on the fact that they're all going to be really similar because they were worked on with the CDC. One thing mm -hmm. that is a real commonality among all the cruise lines is vaccination. So any adult mm -hmm. who is eligible to be vaccinated will need to be vaccinated vaccinated and all crew on board cruise ships are vaccinated. Otherwise, we're seeing testing across the board. So in order to get on a cruise ship, you do have to produce a negative COVID test. Now, mm -hmm. masking has been one of those things that's a little bit back and forth. We've seen the same thing mm -hmm. on land. Sometimes you need them, sometimes you don't. Some cruise lines still require them. Most cruise lines still require them for crew. Um, and then we also have medical facilities on board in case there is a COVID uh, breakout or COVID cases on board. And we're also seeing some contact tracing. So all these things are really designed to keep passengers, the crew, and even the people in the destinations that the cruise lines visit safe. Testing, vaccination, of course, quarantine, if people do get sick on board the cruise. So where are people going? What are some of the great destinations we should keep an eye on? Well, right now, Alaska is so hot. Um, Alaska is one of those destinations that for a lot of people, it's really a dream vacation. Over the last two years, people weren't really able to visit. There was a partial cruise season to Alaska last year, uh, but this is really going to be the first year that it's kicking off full steam. As a matter of fact, the first ships are just getting there now, uh, and you mm -hmm. can get there on those big cruise ships on a luxury ship or even an expedition ship. Also, we're seeing a lot of interest in those expedition routes. So places like the Galapagos and Antarctica mm. are super hot. Uh, as a matter of fact, this Antarctica season, which really begins uh, in that November time period, is looking to be the biggest Antarctica season ever. Also, if you can believe it, people are loving world cruises, which they started about 120 days and, and beyond. Uh, this is lots of time at sea, but the cool thing is yeah. you really see the whole world on these world cruises. We've been hearing that they've been selling out within 24 hours, so people are really anxious. That pent up demand is there and they're ready to get out on the road. Yeah, after being in your house, now you're ready to see the world and be on the water for 120 days. Last question for you quickly. Talk to us about how do we find deals? Because obviously things cost so much more right now. Yeah, and I talked about high demand. Um, that is actually the case with cruising right now. We are not seeing a lot in the way of deals because the demand is so high. Mm -hmm. Now that said, you always can look for a last minute deal and that's really a deal under 90 days or so out. It, you might find a little bit of a discount on your cruise. The caveat is you might not get the cabin you want on the ship you want mm. and maybe not even exactly the destination that you want to visit. So do mm. be aware of that. Instead, what you might want to look for are additional perks. And this is fairly common from the cruise lines where they give you things like free Wi-Fi, uh, free beverage packages, mm -hmm. uh, even included gratuities. So it's a great way. And ultimately, it might actually save you more than a discount off your fare. Okay, fantastic trips, tips rather. Colleen McDaniel, thank you so much. Well, families love amusement parks, but they can be pricey. Next up, ways to save and how to maximize your next outing. Consumer Confidential is coming right back. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Ali Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. 
Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Amusement parks are a big attraction, and while COVID slowed down business and even closed some of the parks, they are looking to bounce back. In 2019, the top 20 theme parks in North America combined saw more than 151 million visitors. And while the parks are fun, they can certainly be pricey. The average American spent about 700 bucks on admissions and fees in 2019. So to make the most out of your next visit, theme park expert Nikita Metellus is here with helpful hacks and ways to save you some money. Nikita, Thanks for joining us. These are important questions, especially for families. Let's start with the big ticket item, pun intended, park tickets. They're so expensive. Between that and the hotel room, it feels like you've already spent a fortune before you get to the park. So how do people save on these basic costs? Well, the first thing I always recommend is just to set a realistic budget. And once you have that budget, mm -hmm. then go to the discounted theme park ticket websites. They usually have a partnership with some of the theme parks. Also, mm -hmm. authorized vacation planners where you can scoop up that theme park ticket with your hotels all into one package. And they can also find deals for you directly from the parks with their relationships with the park at no additional cost to you. What about the theme park affiliated hotels? Usually they're pricier than the other options that are nearby, but are they worth it? They can be worth it if you are staying with a theme park hotel that's owned and operated by the theme park, then definitely the perks of getting into the park early to start your day, getting free transportation can help. But if you mm -hmm. are more of a budget friendly family, then I recommend using some of the affiliate hotels that also mm -hmm. offer free shuttle, but you may not be able to get into the park early, but you'll be mm -hmm. able to still get your transportation. Sometimes they offer free breakfast. So definitely mm -hmm. do not forget about those offerings. Okay, yeah, those are good perks. So we spent the money on the tickets, we've picked our hotel. How do we make the most of our time when we're at the park? Before you even get there, listen to me. You have to plan. You have to know what your must-do rides and attractions are. And then many of the theme parks have things like apps that you can download to get familiar with all of the offerings there. You can book your reservations through there. You can see the wait times. And do not be that person who gets the app right at the park. You don't want to do that. You want to get some very the app before you get there, but definitely get there early. Know what you want to ride. That way, once you get all your rides done, you can go watch a parade, watch a show, or go back on mm -hmm. some of your must-do attractions. I love that. So download the app, spend time getting familiar with it, and you have to kind of have a game plan, right? What do you, what do you think about the ideal amount of time to spend at a theme park? Whether you're traveling like as a group of adults, it might be different than if you've got little ones. Yes, if you have little ones, then you know that they have to have their nap time. They have to stay on their schedule. So if you do have little ones, I do recommend that you get there still early and then go back to your hotel room to kind of take a break, make sure they can refuel fuel up and then come back. And then if you are an adult going with a group of adults or a solo traveler and you love theme parks, then I could say that about six to 10 hours is good for an adult going to the parks. If you are a big family and this is your big vacation, then you might as well do the whole day. Most of the parks are open for 12 hours. You get there mm -hmm. in the morning. Like I said, take a break at your hotel, come back in the evening and catch all the evening shows and just close out the park. Yeah, I love that. Maximize your time. Okay, before I let you go, tell me about the hottest attractions for visitors this summer and the food. What, what do people need to know about like trying to get like the, the foods that are so good? 
Well, I'll start with the food because I love the food part. <laughs> well, when I go to resorts or theme parks like Universal Orlando Resort, I like to first stop off at the Voodoo Donut. That's kind of like my little mm -hmm. thing I like to do. But when I'm in the park, I love to get a crepe from the Central Park Crepery. And if you are a Harry Potter fan, and even if you're not, you still have to get that famous butterbeer, no matter how you want to take it. I like mine hot and sometimes ice mm -hmm. cream, but if you are a true classic person, then you have to get that butterbeer. When I'm at Epcot, I'm getting the avocado margarita. That's just my adult oh. take. As far as I Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure at Universal mm -hmm. and Star mm -hmm. Wars Rise of the Resistance at Disney. Absolutely incredible attractions. And you're making us want to go. Nikita, thank you so much. We appreciate it. We should also mention NBC News and Universal are owned by the same parent company. All right, everyone, that is our time for now. For all of us here at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. Until next time, happy travels. Lynn, great to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for doing this. It's my pleasure. I told you I just finished Tick, Tick, Boom, and I have days worth of questions. But I'll try to condense it for you a little okay. bit. I think we should first just start talking about Jonathan Larson and this story, the basis for sure. it. People know Rent. Yeah. They may not know the story of Jonathan Larson. So where do we pick up his story with Tick, Tick, Boom, and, and why did you view it as something that you wanted to dive into? Just the existence of Tick, Tick, Boom is really curious thing. Not a lot of people write their own autobiographies mm -hmm. at age 29, um, but Jonathan Larson was an aspiring composer, lyricist, he spent his 20s, the 80s, um, trying to get this musical, this dystopian sci-fi musical called Superbia off the ground. He had applied for the rights to 1984, he couldn't get him for the Orwell estate, he made his own dystopia. Um, and despite grants and despite the mentorship of Stephen Sondheim and folks really in the know in the theater, no one wanted to make this thing. And his way of processing that loss and the time he'd spent writing this thing no one would ever see was to write a musical about it. So he All writes right. a show called Tick, Tick, Boom about a young singer, songwriter, composer turning 30 and questioning everything. Um, and it's a snapshot of him as a young man and a young artist. It's a snapshot of the AIDS crisis unfolding at that time and the beginning of losing a generation of talent. Um, and it's also about doubling down on your passion even when the world is telling you no, as it was very clearly telling him no. He died tragically of an aortic dissection, uh, which was um, an undiagnosed Marfan syndrome. He died just before the first preview of Rent off-Broadway. Um, and Rent is so much about life, and it is so much about appreciating life while it's here that, you know, that thing took off like a rocket. Can you explain for people why Rent was so revolutionary? I saw it for my 17th birthday. My high school girlfriend, Meredith Somerville, took me to the last <laughs> row of the mezzanine of the Nederlander Theater, and I'll always be in her debt for that. It was the most contemporary feeling show I'd ever seen. It incorporated pop music and rock music and techno, and um, it just sounded like today. It was the most diverse cast I'd ever seen on Broadway, that beautiful, like, mosaic of humanity that comes downstage for Seasons of Love at the mm -hmm. top of Act Two. It made me feel like I could have, a, I mean, it's echoed exactly in the opening line of Hamilton, right? When they're all yeah. singing time. Um, and it just made me feel like I, I could have a place up here one day. It felt like he was writing about his community and it was a community trying to stay alive during the AIDS epidemic and trying to hang on to the village they knew in the face of gentrification. And it was the show that gave me permission to, to write a musical um, because it felt like he was writing about his friends. And I was like, oh, I, I could write one one day. And no other musical made me feel like that. I admired them and I loved being in the school play, but they always just felt like they were in some other time and right. some other place. And this felt like here and now and accessible and opened a door, I guess, to In the Heights. I can make a it's, show about where I live. It's a very short walk. It's yeah. just 200 blocks uptown. <laughs> and and to, yeah, you know, and then like, you know, two years later, I'm, I'm writing, um, you know, about my neighborhood and the challenges it's facing and bringing in the music that I know and advancing that thesis Jonathan Larson had that like, Musical theater should be in touch with the rest of the world. That was something he felt really passionately mm. about and in conversation with the world. I read a quote from you that really struck me where you said, if they let me direct one movie, let it be this one. 
it had been living in my heart for so long and it's the show that clarified my resolve. Um, I remember saying to myself, I will do this even if the world doesn't notice. Mm. I understood Jonathan's struggle, I knew a lot about it and I also, you know, know, know a little bit about what it is to be a songwriter for theater where the gulf between what's in your head and anyone seeing it is so wide. Right. It's not like we're novelists and we can self-publish. We need other people to realize the thing that's in our head. And um, that's an, it's an enormous pressure. I think the reason this movie is gonna resonate with so many people is not just because it reflects your story, but it reflects everyone's story in some way. Not that they're yeah. a playwright or that they dream of, of writing a great musical, but they've been in a position like he was like you were, yeah. where you're like, I think I'm good at this. I'm working really hard at it and no one's noticing. Yeah. How do I get over that wall? This is a movie about someone who spent 10 years making something no one wanted to see and no one has seen. And I think we've all been in that position of, I've been putting everything, all of my eggs into this basket and nothing's happening. And like, how do, what do I do from here? Um, what are the other roads uh, besides the thing I always wanted to do? And we all have, a, we have many moments like that through our lives. And so I just, I hope this movie hits people the way it hit me, the story hit me when I was 21 years old, where it just like, it clarified my resolve. And we all have that in us. We all have some version of that story. Yeah, it's, absolutely. I guess it's not gonna happen. Maybe I should go do this, yeah. maybe I should go do that. And, you know, it was important for us too because, you know, Jonathan's version is very much from his perspective to, like, understand that there are a great many roads to happiness in this life. Most of us aren't lucky enough to do what we love for a living. Most of us find a way to carve out the space for that so that we still have a lovely and fulfilling life. And that's, I think, important. What were those moments for you in your life, Lynn, where you were like, maybe this isn't gonna happen. Maybe this, sure. in the heights that I've been working on since college, isn't gonna get made. Were there moments where you said, okay, I'm gonna go work at the advertising firm like we see in the movie or do something <laughs> right. else? Yeah, sure. I mean, well, it's, it's a pretty short line from seeing Rent at 17 to starting to write in the Heights at 19, <laughs> okay. uh, my sophomore year, um, because the things that Jonathan did with Rent are all things I believed in. I believe musical theater should be in communication with pop music and popular culture. And my early attempts at writing musicals were all Larson knockoffs. I was trying to sound like him. And then In the Heights was the first time I tried to start it to sound like myself, because I right. did what Jonathan did. I brought in the Latin music I grew up with, the hip hop music I grew up with, into my work. Everybody's got a job, everybody's got a dream. You know, with, within the Heights, it was a six year, it was my 20s. And the, the advantage um, I had, or I guess the head start I had, was that I found amazing collaborators that made my work better um, sooner. Speaking of Jonathan Larson and, and finding somebody to fill those shoes, Andrew Garfield is extraordinary in yeah. this. What did you see in him that you thought, he's the guy? Yeah, well I knew I needed a theater beast. I knew that you can't just like cast a movie star as Jonathan Larson because Jonathan Larson lived and breathed the theater and in my conception of the movie, he would be playing piano and singing for half the film. And uh, I was lucky enough to see Andrew Garfield uh, in a play prior in Angels in America, Tony Kushner's masterpiece at the National in London before mm. it came to Broadway. And you know, it's a six and a half, seven hour show. It's in two parts. You see the matinee, you eat dinner, you see part two. I did it, yeah. And <laughs> I remember just taking the cab home being like, that guy can do anything. Mm. Um, that guy can do anything. And, and he, you know, he, he became Jonathan Larson in my head in that moment. Does he remind you in any way of Jonathan based on what you know about Jonathan 100%. Larson? Well, they're both incredibly deep thinkers about their craft yeah. and they think about why they do what they do so intensely. And he can sing. And, and he can Garfield really can sing. He can really sing. As yeah. soon as he told me, you know, it's something I have not done, but it's a thing I've always wanted to explore, I knew we were good because I knew he would go all the way in. On, on doing what he needed to do, and I just needed to give him the resources and the time to get where he needed to get. What does it take to wake up a generation? And we had about a year and a half between that first conversation and um, really starting to pick up steam with the project, so it was, you know, I, I wasn't worried. Hey. 
Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. As you look back on your own story pre Jonathan Larson, when did you start to discover that you maybe had a talent or at least a passion for? Making music, writing songs, performance. Yeah. What was that moment? Well, I was I was a film baby first. So I was, you know, my dad had an early camcorder and I was making movies since I was seven years old. And my in the summers, my grandfather uh, owned a video store in Puerto Rico called Miranda Video. Um, and uh, he would lend me, he would, he was a bank manager at the local town bank and he would, he would lend me the camcorder that they used for surveillance footage no that was way. mounted up in the corner Come and on. I would film movies and you can see I have like old stop motion videos of GI Joes hitting each other and in between them you see footage of people online at the bank. <laughs> 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 and, um, but again, like, it was an amazing, it w there were amazing summers. I would just watch any movie that I felt like taking home, and some of them very age-inappropriate, uh, but I just watched anything and everything, and, and, and then was, like, making little movies just sort of at my grandparents' house. And so that was my first love, and then I fell in love with theater uh, because of my elementary school music teacher, Barbara Ames, uh, and our shop teacher, Robert Sherman. They would always direct the sixth grade play. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the whole school sees a sixth grade play. So by the time you're in fifth grade, you're like, what are we going to do <laughs> for our sixth grade play? And for our sixth grade play, we did previous, we did like 20 minute versions of the previous six years for the productions. Oh, wow. So it was this four hour, I, I shudder as a parent to think, four hour um, like medley where I got to play a farmer in Oklahoma, a son in Fiddler, Bernardo in West Side Story, Captain Hook, an Adipearl backup in The Wiz, and then the most important, Conrad Birdie in Bye Bye Birdie. Mm. And when you play Conrad Birdie and you're 12 oh. and you're three feet tall, and every time you sing, everyone is supposed to faint <laughs> and gasp, Conrad! I was like, I'm doing this for the rest of my life. <laughs> like, there was no other choice. Um, and so I really sort of fell in love with school theater uh, as a result and just started auditioning for the school play and then went to graduated to directing the school play because it was all student run uh, at Hunter High School. And um, yeah, that was, that was my path. But I always wanted to do both things. So I've sort of come a long way to come back around to my first love of you know, stealing my grandpa's bank camcorder. That's incredible. That's incredible. I didn't even know those came off the ceiling. That's yeah. very impressive. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't the smaller ones that they <laughs> those, have now. It school. was the like, take out the cassette. <laughs> I think also an important part of your story that leads you to In the Heights and, and Hamilton as well is music, hip hop of that time. Yeah. We were both late 80s, early 90s fans 100%. of everything that was happening. And man, for me, who grew up on that, to sit in that theater and listen to Hamilton, to hear all those sometimes obscure references. Yeah. It was amazing. So how important was that education in hip hop to the style that you created for your shows? Sure. Well, listen, I'm a little younger than hip hop itself and I grew up one neighborhood south of the Bronx. As you know, like having a cooler older sibling is always going to be an advantage in terms of your taste. So I remember stealing her De La Soul CDs uh -huh. and her Ice Cube cassettes and Tribe Called Quest. You know, 
everyone thinks the music they listen to when they were a teenager is the best, but we're right. Um, because I think there was so much diversity um, in the genre of hip hop right at that time. It was like you had PM Dawn next to Grave Diggers, next to Tribe Called Quest, next to you know Dre and Snoop. It's all in there. There's a moment in, in your life, again, the parallels of, of Larson, where your father writes you a, a letter where you're at this crossroads, yeah. right? And you're thinking, okay, I don't know if it's gonna happen the same way Jonathan Larson taught. Okay. What did he say in that letter and what did it yeah. mean to you? Well, what was scary to me was that I, my, my first job out of college was teaching English at my old high school and I loved it. Yeah. Like, it's, a, it's very exciting to watch kids fall in love with writing and fall in love with poetry and fall in love with literature and being able to help spark that that connection that you know will feed you your whole life if it happens early. Um, and so they had offered me a full-time position uh, and I could see the Mr. Holland's opus version of my life where I just kind of teach kids yeah. and hopefully I'm fondly remembered and never finish my play, never finish my symphony in Mr. Holland's mm -hmm. case. Um, and I, I, I wrote my dad and said like, what do I do? Like, I could also just like quit and sub and I may not make my rent month to month, but I'll have time to work on this thing. And, and he said, I really want to tell you to take the full-time job. I really want to tell you. Uh, but I would be betraying, um, you know, the, the memory of my own mother who, when I told her I have to go to Puerto Rico to go to school, didn't blink. Um, and I, you, you have to do the thing that matters the most to you um, and, and follow your gut. What a blessing. What an absolute blessing, because that, was, that guy was also saying, be a lawyer, the entire time I was in high school and college. And, and so something switched, and, uh, and the way in which he kind of gave me the right advice right when I needed it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Look who's back together. Oh, I'm so, so happy. At me. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. We will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. So when did In the Heights click? You finished it, this is your great work, you've hung in, you've put in all these years to get it done. What was the moment where you got a phone call or talked to somebody and said, oh, this is gonna, this is gonna go, this is gonna work? Honestly, I felt so much lighter the moment we did our first performance on, on stage. And I was able to experience that because I've already like, been able to cross that distance that Jonathan never got to cross. Yeah. You know, because that was my yardstick and that was my inspiration. It was like, oh my gosh, this thing is going to be on stage and I've done it. I've gotten it across the finish line. Forget like how long it runs. Forget like it exists. Other people know it. It is on sheet music. It is no longer just in my head. It's out in the mm -hmm. world. So many people in the country around the world picked you up after Hamilton exploded. 
but you have to look back at In the Heights where you won four Tony Awards, you were best musical. I thought it did everything a show can do. Like we right. we we did it. Like we won the big prize. Yeah. We made back our investors' money. Um, you know, and we had suddenly all these incredible roles for Latino performers, which was an incredible uh, is the incredible legacy that kind of keeps on giving as I meet more and more artists for whom Heights was their first show, or Nina first spoke to them as a character. Yeah, then you go on vacation, read yeah, Ron Chernow's book. Yeah, it's a good book. It's a good, very good book. <laughs> and you come up with a preposterous idea. <laughs> You're gonna tell the story of the Founding Fathers with black and Latin cast yeah. through hip hop. The earliest pitch of that idea, how was it received? Um, luckily, it was it was to be it was to people who'd been with me before, uh, so they're like, all right, you know. Um, but it was yeah, it's a terrible pitch. Uh, it's a terrible elevator pitch. But you know, it's funny. Like the first time I ever performed anything from it was was at the White House. It was two thousand nine. Right. I'd been invited to perform something from In the Heights. It was like the White House's first evening of poetry and spoken word, and they said, unless you have something about the American experience, and I was like. I got 16 bars on Hamilton. <laughs> I don't really have a chorus yet. I'll write it for this occasion. And I just thought, if it doesn't work in this room, it's probably as bad as everyone says it is. <laughs> but if anyone's gonna get it, it's this White House first in hip hop and in the history of the room in which we find ourselves in. And uh, I've never been more nervous in my life. I'm sure. In a lot of ways, it was insane and foolhardy to perform such an unfinished piece on such a you know, national visible stage. Um, on the other hand, it gave me resolve for, you know, and strengthened my resolve that this is a good idea because I saw how it played in that room. Right. Alexander Hamilton, we were waiting in the weeds for you. What was the moment where you and everybody in the cast said, there's something happening It was here. when your mom called you and said, we have to see this play. Cause she did? She saw it at the public. She did? That's a true story. <laughs> That's the moment. <laughs> well, there was a lot of little moments. I remember thinking, if nothing else, this will have a healthy life because school groups, if they can get over the three uses of the F word, will like, will bring their kids. You know, I, I, I knew enough about the business that like if you can get the school group crowd, like you can fill a Wednesday matinee. Field trips. Field trips, field <laughs> trips are the lifeblood <laughs> of our industry. Um, and so, and I knew that we had overlap with AP US history. Um, so I, like that was my pragmatic thought. Right. Uh, we can run a couple of years on school trips alone. <laughs> um, and, and then I think when we announced our second extension and the tickets went on sale, I remember Oscar Eustace came into the theater and said, the phones are broken. We've had the website go down due to ticket sale demand. We've never had someone break the phones. Like this is another thing. That's when I knew we were in a weird other place that somehow we'd gotten the thing that you, no one can buy, which is everyone who left the show told five people you have to see the show. Right. And you can't buy that and you can't fake that. Um, it happens or it doesn't and it has, we just celebrated our 2,000th performance on Broadway Congrats. yesterday. That's amazing. And I, I never in a million years would have imagined it. I know it's hard to have any perspective on something you're so close to, but are you able, with a little distance now, to articulate why it caught fire the way it did, beyond the originality of it and how great the music is and the acting, the performances, but what was it about that that was so different from anything else we'd seen? Well, I think the things that it's quote unquote are about are not really what it's about. It's not really about American history, although it details American history. It's not really about politics, although it is in a way about the birth of our American politics and how everything that was present uh, at the founding, good and bad, is still present in our present day. It's really about what are we doing with our time. It's the same thing Tick Tick Boom's about. Yeah. How do we respond to the fact that we don't know how long we have here? Yeah. Um, and so you can't leave that show without thinking, what am I doing with my yes. life? In, uh, you know, I, I always tell folks, like, I didn't get like, thank you for the tickets text. I would get like 3 a.m. what am I doing with my life emails totally. um, in those early days when people saw the show for the first time. And so I think that's the secret sauce of it. Can you uh, speak to what it's done to your life? Forget the professional side of it, but to go from a <laughs> highly regarded Broadway composer and actor within the Heights to something completely else I, around I, the world. Yeah, it, it's, um, I kept waiting for my life to come back to normal and it still hasn't happened. You know, I've, 
I, and in a way, I feel lucky that I had 35 years of a very normal life right. before it happened because I already knew who I was when the success happened. I was still doing the show. I was in seven shows a week. I couldn't go to all the things that were being thrown at me and all the invites. I was like, no, I have two shows tomorrow. Right. <laughs> right. I can't go out. Um, and I also, you know, I was very well settled and I have a family and, and a wife that really keeps my head on a head on straight. But in terms of the show itself, you, you, there's a point at which you have to think of it as separate from you. I remember when it only lived in my arms, right. but now it belongs to the world in a very real way, and you have to then figure out, all right, what, what else can I do? What else am I making? To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. also got the animated film Encanto, yes. which is about to come out. What is that story? And again, as you looked at the menu of possibilities, what grabbed you about that? Yeah, well, I had such a great time working on Moana. Um, I was working on it at the same time as Hamilton, um, often writing in my dressing room in between shows. And I just said, I want to be in there from the beginning on the next one, because I was, I was hired several years into the development process on Moana. And if it's Latino themed, like I'm there, like you just have to call me. <laughs> um, and so I was able to be there from the beginning of the process. We knew we wanted to set in Latin America and the team was really inspired by the literature and culture of magical realism that came out of Colombia. And, um, and then the, the fun part um, was we really wanted to write a thing about family. Like that's what kind of kept coming up in our conversations. Um, so often in the movie making process, it becomes about your main character and their quest and anything that isn't to do with that quest and the stakes like gets paired away. When I got hired for Moana, Moana had eight brothers. Moana had more important stuff to do. <laughs> Goodbye, eight brothers, like, let's go. Let's go save the world. Um, and so we really kind of started with the thesis of can we make the relationships between our family members the actual meat of the story um, and how those relationships shift and change and grow or the distance between how you see yourself versus the role you play in your family and sometimes that's really short and sometimes it's a gulf in time every member of our family cecilia up top was given their own magical gift to then explore that in, in Colombia through the sort of amazing prism of Colombian music and culture has been just this joyous five years. And again, working at the same time as I'm editing Tick, Tick, Boom. But when I, when I do have more than one project, something that I kind of do that is, it's like a helpful like trick I play on myself is I just pretend I'm back in school. And I go, these aren't projects, these aren't responsibilities, they're classes, I'm, take, I'm auditing Jonathan Larson intensive. I'm auditing this Disney songwriting process. And if I think of it that way, um, because college sets you up to think this way, I think about the ways in which they feed each other. Um, I don't think about like, oh God, I've got all this to do, and oh God, I've got all this to do. Right. I think, oh, this uh, informs this, and I can take what I'm learning from this and apply it here. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a silly, and it's only a game I play in my own mind, but it's really helpful in terms of, 
changing your mindset from I have to do this to I get to do this. Right. Uh, and that's all the difference in the world. We were talking about John Leguizamo, and in our interview he said, the phone rang one day, and he said it was the great Lin-Manuel Miranda. He said, I couldn't believe he was calling me. And I suspect you feel just the opposite. I can't believe I live I in a world where I get to call John Leguizamo. I can't believe he's in the movie. So as a first time director, Tick, Tick, Boom is over, credits come up, directed by Lin-Manuel Miranda. What did that feel like? Oh man, you're, you're trying to make me cry with this question and you're going to succeed. Um, it felt amazing. I, um, you know, it's, it's, such a, it's such a dream come true for me. There were challenges to this film. We made this film in the midst of a pandemic because we all took it so seriously. And um, there were so many times when I thought this movie would never get made. And so to be on this side of it is just, it's an enormous relief. And, and um, what I'm most proud of is the fact that the people in Jonathan's life are so proud of the film. Mm. You know, that community that I first met when I met them all in 2014 and Julie Larson and Vicki Leacock and Jonathan Burkhart and Matt O'Grady and all of the people who, who truly um, were there for Jonathan's journey see him in the film. And mm. that's, that means I've done my job. Boy, if you didn't have enough pressure directing your first film, you want to get it right for all them, yeah, right? Yeah. Amen. But in a way, it's liberating because your, your, your ego is totally out of the process. It's how right. do I do right by, by this artist? Um, and um, I'm just, I'm just so proud. You should be. It's yeah. amazing. Congrats. Thank you. Well, good for you. I, I could talk to you all day, but I know you have other places yeah. to be. It's so great to talk yeah, to you. Thank, thank you. you for everything you've yeah, put into the culture, you. man. It's oh, thank you awesome. so much. This thank is a great you. conversation. Well, hello there, friends. Thanks for tuning in to our midweek edition of Popstar Plus. On the show today, we're going to catch up with Olympic gold medalist and model Eileen Gu, plus the cast of Girls 5 Eva joined us to talk about their show's latest season. And later, it is National Pet Month, so we're going to share some stories of celebs and their pets. This time around, Lance Bass is going to weigh in. But first, here's today's Popstar headlines. Pop start, guys. I hate uh -huh. to cut off all the dream talk here, but we're going to start with Rita Moreno. We've got a sneak peek of Hoda's interview with the Hollywood and Broadway legend who happens to be one of this year's honorees of Inspiring America, the 2022 Inspiration List. Carson, lucky me, man. I got to sit down with her. She's 90 years young. She made history in 62, the first Latina to win an Oscar for her role as Anita in West Side Story. And she told me what that moment meant, not only to her, but to her whole community. And you know what I loved about that moment? I mean, it was your moment, but it was not just your moment. Oh, I love you for saying that. It was that. not just your moment. It was my people. Oh my God, they cheered in Harlem. People yelling out the windows, she did it, she did it. And you know, as a friend of mine said, what they were really saying was, we did it. Ugh. We did it. Uh, I, had chills. I had chills from everything that she's been through um, and everything. She just exemplifies, she's, she's an icon. It's well, you great. can see Hoda's interview with Rita and hear many more incredible individuals on our primetime special. We had Lester here last week talking about this as well. Some other names on that list, some great ones. Inspiring America, the 2022 Inspiration List. It airs Saturday. You cannot miss it. It's on NBC, <laughs> MSNBC, CNBC, and you can also catch it Sunday. Monday over on Telemundo and streaming as well. That is not all. Monday, Hoda's interview with Rita that you just saw a clip of is going to be out in a special so bonus podcast oh, episode so of Making Space. Okay. All right, next up, Red Table Talk. We've got an exclusive first look at today's new episode featuring the mom and stepdad of 2019 Miss USA, Chesley Christ, who tragically died by suicide earlier this year. Speaking out for the first time, April Simpkins opens up about the day she found out her daughter was gone. Oh, when I finally made it home, and got to my husband who was tr trying to understand what I was saying. So that was when we reached out to the police, like we got this message, get paramedic there. So immediately I'm thinking, okay, this must be like the first attempt, let's get on a plane, get up there, meet her at the hospital, yeah. let's see what we can do. We're texting the family. Um, we don't live in New York. We made it to the airport. We got on the plane, which is now taxiing when the police confirmed that she was no longer with us. Oh, oh, this is so tough. You can catch the new episode of Red Table Talk streaming today at 12 p.m. Eastern on Facebook Watch. All right, next up, Keith Morrison, the man with the golden voice is at it again. This time, Keith's lending his buttery smooth narration to the latest sleep story over on the <laughs> Oh, yes. 
Uh, it's called The Curious Case of the Overnight Oats. <laughs> By the way, Dateline fans apparently have been asking for this for years. We found two years ago on Twitter, somebody wrote, I wish Keith Morrison was my dad. Can you imagine the bedtime stories? Another asking, does Keith Morrison uh, narrate anything other that is not about murder? Because I like his voice before I go to bed, but I could do without the nightmares. <laughs> well, yesterday, Dateline hopped on Twitter to announce the wait is over. Take a listen. It's a story about a bear. The bear who didn't know what to do and didn't have many options. Is that a six hour story? <laughs> that was the intro to the bear. We're going to be here a while. It's nice to see how he sits when he does. Yes, it oh. is. You can hear the full sleep story on the Calm app. It is streaming. What's, now. what's great about Keith is when we saw him last week, like, he talks like that in real yes, life. Yeah. It's not like, it's yeah. not an act. Yeah. Would he you like the to phone. take my mic? Hello. Oh. <laughs> I see that. Next up, Daniel Radcliffe. Showed you a little bit of this earlier. The Harry Potter star is completely transformed in the first teaser. For Weird, the Al Yankovic story, Radcliffe stepping into the shoes of the song parody hit maker for Roku's upcoming biopic, which, by the way, is co-written by Yankovic himself. Here's a little bit of that trailer. Hope you guys are ready for this. Anyone got an accordion? <laughs> so much about that that is just how I'm dying to see. Weird is set to start streaming this fall. Mm. Doesn't make good one. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So weird outfit. Yeah. Yeah. I see yeah. That. Oh, and finally, we've been teasing this one for a while. The class of 2022 Ooh. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees. Uh, all right, so here we go. In the performing category, congratulations Wait, to Molly Parton. I thought she yeah. said she didn't. Yeah, that she I'll get to that. Okay. By the way, congratulations to Savannah's high school dreamy crush. Duran Duran. And the boys of Duran Duran. Eminem. The Rhythmics. Carly Simon. Oh, that's going to be so good. Lionel Richie. What? And lastly, Pat Benatar for five artists. This was their first time on the ballot. What are your reactions? So does that mean they're in? They're in. They are yeah. in. They're They'll in. all perform. They have a big show. You yes. Went yes. I went so one year. year. It's so cool. Oh. The show's coming up. And this is, by the way, another side note that's great. This is the first time that six female acts are being inducted into wow. one class, including Dolly Parton, who there was a little bit of confusion back in yeah. March because she had asked to be withdrawn from consideration. Mm -hmm. Then she recently came back and said she would accept the honor. She still want to take somebody else's spot, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Yeah. But we love Dolly, and she's in. Dolly, six decades in the music business. She recorded more than 50 studio <laughs> albums. Wow. That's 5-0, written thousands of songs. <laughs> Well-deserved. That induction ceremony is great. It's November 5th. It's going to air um, at a later date on HBO. So it's not live, but it's on HBO Max. Also, it'll be on Sirius XM. You can find more about the inductees over at today.com. Big congratulations to all the Hall of Fame. Of a list. That was really that cool. Yeah. 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 Especially yeah. Eminem. I'm happy for Eminem. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Cool. A few more items for you. First up, Pistols. The new trailer here is by one of my favorite directors, Danny Boyle. He's in charge of the upcoming series about the legendary punk rockers who made up Sex Pistols. So this show's based off a of guitarist, Steve Jones's Jonesy. His 2017 memoir, Lonely Boy, is going to track the fast rise to fame for the Pistols that they had before the band dissolved just three years later. Here's a bit of the trailer. Whether you can play is not the criteria. It's whether you've got something to say. Come see us play. We're awful. We're creating a revolution. I don't want musicians, I want saboteurs, assassins. What do you want to say with your music? Actually, we're not into music. We're into chaos. That, it looks good. Chaos, to say the least. The six-episode limited series is going to start streaming on Hulu May 31st. Looking forward to that. Finally, Creedence Clearwater Revival. Play the music. The iconic rock band's getting the documentary treatment in a new movie titled Traveling Band, CCR at the Royal Albert Hall. The film is set to feature newly restored performance footage that have been gathering dust, sitting in a vault in London for the past five decades. Director Bob Smeaton's gonna be at the helm of this project. Bob's done documentaries for a lot of other music greats, Beatles, Jimi Hendrix come to mind. And the cherry on top for this particular project is Academy Award winner in long time, Creedence fan Jeff Bridges will narrate this documentary. Those, my friends, are your pop start headlines for today. Coming up next, very impressive young woman, Olympic champ Eileen Gu. She's in the house. She'll tell us what's up next on Pop Star Plus. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking. Yeah. Bye. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? 
Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. My name is this. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia, could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Ali Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. California-born freestyle skier Eileen Gu made waves when she competed for China at this year's Winter Olympics. She took home three medals. Two of them happened to be gold. And then this week, after strutting her stuff at the Met Gala in New York, she joined us in Studio 1A to update us on everything that's happening in her life. The breakout star of the Winter Olympics, her name is Eileen Gu, the teen phenom, racked up several gold medals on the slopes. She's been juggling her newfound fame with competitions, college on the horizon, and a stunning appearance at this week's Fashion's Biggest Night. Take a look. This is what February looked like for 18-year-old freestyle skier Eileen Gu. Golden. Oh my God, I'm not crying. Definitely not crying. The American-born teen who grew up in California won not one, not two, but three Olympic medals for Team China, honoring her mother's home country on the international stage. The golds in big air and half pipe make Eileen the youngest freestyle skiing champion in Olympic history and the first freestyle skier to win three medals at a single Winter Olympics. She used her podium finishes as a platform to cheer on the next generation of young women in her sport. It's always been about encouraging girls it's always been about showing people what's possible a mission Eileen has been on since she was in seventh grade I encourage you all to step out of your comfort zone to show the boys that girls are just as powerful as they are since Beijing Eileen's gone from smashing records in historic fashion to becoming a fashion icon making a name for herself as one of the faces of luxury brands Louis Vuitton and Tiffany's rocking both on the red carpet at fashion's famous first Monday in May the Met Gala Eileen, it's so good to have you in studio. By the way, you really are the whole package. I mean, Savannah and I were just talking about you. You, um, first of all, an Olympic gold medalist. You're, you, you're everything in fashion. What did you get on your SATs? I got a 1580 on my SAT. Okay, did you study? Do you study all the time? Are you a hard worker, or do things just come easy for you? I did take every single available <laughs> online test for the SAT, so I'm not gonna sit back and be like, oh, it was easy. But um, yeah, it was. It was just standardized tests, and you can study for them. Well, hard work seems to be your theme. Uh, when you got those medals in Beijing, was it was it a pinch me moment, or was it like lots and lots of practice that happened to work out perfectly on that day? I think it was both. The mm -hmm. really standout moment for me was when I landed that 1620 in Big mm -hmm. Air, which was my first event. And I've always said, you know, my message is about inspiring young girls and um, inspiring more people to hear about the sport and to use it as a force to. To create interconnection and cross-cultural communication mm -hmm. and I knew that it was such a big moment and there were so many people watching mm -hmm. and it was my time to live up to that standard that I've set and so in that sense I was like no matter what there is no failure because if I don't land the worst failure is to not try 
So I just wanted to try it, and I'd never done it before. I'd never even tried it on airbag or anything, and wow. um, landed it, got that gold medal, and I was on top of the world. Well, your mom taught you well. You can tell that she's always supporting you. She's actually here in studio. And you did make a decision uh, to compete for China. And I was just wondering the thought process, because I know that wasn't an easy decision. I know it came with backlash. So tell me about that piece. Yeah, so for me, it's always been about using force, uh, using sport as a force of communication. Mm -hmm. And especially in a sport like free skiing, it's so free, it's so personal. You use it and it's creative, there's style. And a lot of people in China had never even heard of it. And so kind of introducing that sport culture to younger girls especially is it changed my life you mm -hmm. know and so to be able to have that kind of contact with the sport and now there are 300 million people in China who've gone on snow after the Winter Olympics and that impact is absolutely insane. Did you feel like you needed to have a thick skin for for what came at you after that? Absolutely I mean people always have their own opinions but for me what I try to stick to is I know that there, there's no wrong or right. There's only intention. And I'm trying to make the world a better place in my own way. Mm -hmm. And if people disagree with that, that's okay. And I just encourage them to make the world better in their way, right? Mm -hmm. We can approach this situation from different standpoints. So yeah, teach their own. So you're going to Stanford. Is that next on your list? I'm going to college in the fall, yes. Oh my God, so you're going to college in the fall. You're a, you're a, you're a model, you do all that stuff. Are we going to see you at the Olympics again? Is that going to happen, do you think? Who knows? I mean, honestly, I really love skiing still. It is a very personal and expressive part of me, and I think it makes me who I am. It's taught me resilience. It's taught me that um, cross-cultural communication. And so in that sense, yeah, I think why not? But yeah, let's see how school goes first. You are a lovely and delightful person. And again, your mom's here cheering you on. No one's beaming bigger than she is. I don't know if we did get a shot of her because we, we did. Oh, good. I just want just want to make sure that she gets her air time, too. I know she doesn't love to be on camera, but we had to show her. Eileen, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming to see us. Congrats on all of your success. Thank you so much, Hoda. That is an impressive human right there. So great to hear from Eileen. Shout out to her mom who was with her, who was just so sweet. All right, next up, they're gonna be famous, Five Eva. Our raucous visit with the ladies from the Peacock hit next. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking down. Yeah. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking down. Yeah. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. NBC News, streaming free now. And welcome back to Popstar Plus, the hit show Girls 5 Eva is back for season two. We couldn't help but enjoy having the stars with us. We got the cast of Girls 5 Eva. <laughs> we love it. The nominated Peacock original comedy is back for a new season. It follows a one-hit <laughs> Wonder Girl group from the 90s, giving their dreams another shot. Take a look. Right now, our best play is to cross-pollinate with people who already have a huge following. Yes. Who do we know? 
Is anyone not blocked by Carson Daly? No. No. Is anyone willing to unblock Fred Durst? No. Absolutely not. <laughs> Yes. So good. Come on. Absolutely. Sorry, Sarah. Sarah. Oh, no, Fred Durst. We brought him here. Okay, <laughs> guys. Sarah Bareilles, Renee Elise Goldsberry, Paula Pell, Busy Phillips. It is so good to see you guys. So you know we are your super fans. We are. I appreciate that. Yes. This show is so fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, for it to come back for a second season, Sarah, were you just like, yes? Oh, we, we, I think it was like before we were done filming the first episode of the first season where we were like, please, can we have a season two? Aww. We just, we love each other so much and it's just, it, it's yeah. such a joy to work on the show. You know what truly. I forgot to, like what I forgot that we've not talked about in what? any interview, what we gave as our crew gift at the wrap of season one what was were those prayer candles, but with our faces on it. <laughs> Who are you people? So that, so that people could just light them to like- Pray for season pray two. Pray for yeah. season two. And it worked. It worked. Oh my God, the, the music always makes me laugh so hard. Oh. We were talking about the Tiny Butt song. <laughs> oh tiny Sarah, butt you come up with- like, <laughs> I love genius. that. Yeah. <laughs> Vanessa Williams singing yeah. that. Yeah. Like, yeah, so how do you guys come up with them? You write some of the music, right? I write very little very of the little. music, okay. I, but Jeff Richmond and Mary yeah. Scardino, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, and there's a whole music team, but Jeff Richmond is sort of like the music guru, and Meredith uh -huh. writes a lot of the lyrics. So, what can you give us a preview a little bit of what's happening in season two? Because now you guys are like you were fake friends yeah. in the girl band back <laughs> in the day. Yes. Now you're kind of like, hey, we're gonna be, we're actually really we gonna be desperately friends. need each other. Yeah, yes. we desperately need friends. Yes. So now what happens? Like, <laughs> yeah. where are you on the journey? And all our filters have fallen off. Right. Yes. So all the bull is gone. So now we're like, we really look at each other and we're ourselves. Yeah. So we kind of fall in love with each other again or for the first time maybe and then uh well, basically, we're making an album it's season two is album mode yeah yes so we this entire season we have a record deal you yes. do yes a very small label very sign small. Yeah. Yeah. property record it's a uh -huh. it's property record property, 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 property brothers have a record brothers. label and we are oh God, we are desperately hilarious. trying to be their their big horse what's your song like, yeah. do you have a hit yeah. do you have a single from the album can we have a little taste yeah Momentum, yeah, yeah, it's a moment. moment. We're contenders, but we can be tender. Unstoppable, this uh, 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 is untoppable. Courageous, don't, don't care what our age is. <laughs> we can keep going. <laughs> we can go in. I we could go on more. That, that is intense. Well, and I, and I, I, I'm singing in the alto line. Courageous, <laughs> don't care what our age is. I'm always on the bottom there. You Love can it. hear me. Does Paula just crack everybody up? Yes. yes. No, wait. How do you stand it? Like, how do you not break well, up? Well, everyone so... cracks everyone up. That's no, why it's but such Paula, a freaking love but fest. But Paula, you're a little, you're kind of by yourself. She's, a little yeah, bit. Is she not? She's by herself. She's yeah. all I'm by trying her. to be good because the first time I was on the Today Show for Wine Country, I immediately said a swear word. You did. <laughs> and Tina turned to me and went, you can't do that. <laughs> now, you know, guys, uh, Savannah's kind of bumming. Yeah, I know. tell them why. Well, all morning long, we just set this up for y'all because okay. you know we're big fans of the show. Huge. Us together. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, Oda, <laughs> we have a season two. How is it with us loving this show so much? They never asked us for a cameo. We could be like, we could do something, you know? And um, Hoda's <laughs> no. like, yeah, huh? yeah. Oh, boy, she's like, no. totally. Well, so then I, I say to the bad. I... the commercial, <gasps> guys, maybe we could do a cameo. And they I say, you. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah next year. Sure. Oda did it. <laughs> well, Oda you're by herself. Well, guys, can you thing, give Oda some news about female bonding and <laughs> sticking by your your yeah. girlfriends? And sometimes Oda, you're the wiki. She went solo. I didn't think you. I didn't think you'd mention it. It's oh, it's so tiny. It's 20 seconds. Yeah. So maybe can you guys have us both back yeah, on? We, yes. Yeah, 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 we're yeah. Sure. It's well, kind of like when you're in high school and and a teacher has some special barbecue and only invites some people and they're like, oh, that was so fun at Mr. Gersh's house. But then that friend pretends. And then you're sitting there like, so it's actually even more than that. Hi, Mr. Gersh. I'm so mad. You know what? Okay. Could do like a musical. Maybe the girls could be on the show oh, doing a musical yes, performance. Yes. Oh, 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 yes. oh, I thought something we were going to get to wrong. sing. And something, Although, one right. of us could go down and you could take our place. Oh my uh, gosh, yes! Is that amazing? Can, can I take we? your place? Yes! Oh, I what? volunteer as no, tribute. You can't. I'll go down. I'll go down. down. They're wrapped. This, okay, they're telling us to wrap. No, they're not. Yes, they are. They said it's forever. All right. See, we're right but, on to Yes. Wrap before I wait, swear. Wait, no, no. You should be the one that licks at the end. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> All right, and don't forget, you can stream the brand new season of Girls 5 Eva on Peacock. Okay. So good. Don't watch unless you want to laugh, smile, and feel yeah, joy. Yeah, feel great. Okay, but if you want those things, this is your show.
Not exactly sure why those characters have some sort of beef with me, but I'm okay with it. Big fan. Still coming up, Lance Bass shares how much he loves his dog and how much that dog has made Lance's life better. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Ashley. you need. Who comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back, friends. This month marks National Pet Month, and we spoke with a guy that I've known for a long, long time now, formerly of InSync, my buddy Lance Bass. So he told us how his furry friends have literally shaped his life. Take a look. Yeah, we do always have little voices for Dale. And they kind of talk like this. Okay, Dale. Um, and then we think Dale has a slight Australian accent just because um, we have these backstories for them that uh, he secretly wants to be a movie star dog and he really wants to be Australian. And so we have like little Aussie voices coming out of him. All right, these are my puppies, Chip and Dale, uh, which is very fitting because they're little rascals and they act like Chip and Dale from, from Disney. And they're mixed breed rescues, so we don't know exactly what they are, but we're assuming they're Chihuahua Terrier. Um, and Dale might even have a little schnauzer in because he's got, he's got that beard. Um, but the sweetest dogs ever. The way we got Chippendale was definitely different from our other rescues. Uh, we weren't really in the market for another dog. Uh, we already had one you know, at the house and we were fostering others. Uh, so these came to us in the most Hollywood way. Uh, it's, it's gaggy, but uh, Kate Beckinsale found these dogs, uh, this litter, um, and rescued them. And she didn't know what to do with them. So she called me and said, I have a litter of dogs, they need help. And so I took them, I gave them to Lisa Vanderpump for her new shelter that wasn't even open yet. Um, so they went and lived there and all of them got adopted uh, immediately except Chip and Dale. And they were the last two in the litter. Um, I walked into Vanderpump Dogs and just fell and loved them. Like, okay, we'll take them home. We'll find them a good home. We'll, you know, we'll foster them until we find them a great home. Uh, and they have not left the house yet. <laughs> it's so weird because when I'm naming dogs, uh, they just come to me easily. Every rescue I've ever had, I've named them kind of on the spot. Chippendale, when I saw the Vanderpump dogs, they were all they were doing was you know fighting like this, just like a dust ball of just wrestling the whole time, and it reminded me of you know Chippendale, you know chipmunks. Uh, so immediately was like, it's Chip and Dale, uh, and it just stuck, and they really live up to their name. Well, it's, it's funny because, you know, they're twins. My dogs are twins, but they have completely different personalities. Um, the one that's a little smaller, Chip, he's the boss. Like, he came, you know, he was number one in the litter, controlled everything, uh, although he's probably the runt of it, too, because he's the smallest of all the dogs, uh, which is probably why he has such an attitude. Uh, but definitely he, he controls the house and, uh, and puts Dale in his place. Um, loves attention, just human attention. He just needs it. He'll crawl inside you and cut it. He gives the best hugs. 
Um, but if Dale tries to get the hugs, he will usher him away, which is like so mean. So we give Dale his own quality time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Chip's the boss and Dale's just a little teddy bear that uh, sometimes feels a little abused by his brother. <laughs> It'll be very interesting to see how Chip and Dale are with the twins. Um, I'm, I'm guessing they're going to be really great because they are fun little gentle dogs uh, and super sweet. But you just never know. And of course, we're going to be very, you know, careful at the beginning of introducing them. Uh, I hear if you, you know, it, it's a better to bring in maybe the baby blanket first, let them sleep with it one night to get used to the smell, um, and then just kind of a slow introduction. Um, let them sniff them a good bit and we'll cuddle a little bit and then hopefully they'll become the best brother and sister ever. It is so strange how dogs can really pick up on your energy and your, your mood. Uh, and there's, you know, several times in the last you know, four years that, you know, you'll have bad days and, you know, some disasters happen in your life and it's like they just know. Um, and the way that they kind of like curl up to you and kind of give you that look of like, you know, I'm here for you. It always comes at the best time. Uh, there's nothing better than a puppy hug. My pets have made my life so much better. I, I do, I mean, there's studies on this saying that, you know, dogs extend your life and I can feel that. And the love that you give and the love that you receive, it, you can't match it anywhere. It's the only unconditional love you'll ever receive. And it's just a beautiful thing. And, you know, they're there for every life moment. Um, and I'm glad that we get to share that. Good to see Lance there. That's a great story. He's a great guy, too. Hey, that's going to do it for today's Popstar Plus. I'm sorry it's over, but tomorrow there's more. So come on back. We're going to be hearing from the star of Jurassic World, the man, Chris Pratt, tomorrow right here on Popstar Plus. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Hello, friends out there watching Today All Day. So glad you tuned into our digital show today in 30 on this Wednesday morning. Yeah, we're going to start the show off with more on the growing fallout and demonstrations surrounding that leaked Supreme Court draft opinion, which would overturn Roe versus Wade. Kristen Wilkers at the White House for us with the latest. Then, with interest rates on the rise to control inflation, Vicki Wynn will be along to share a few ways you can bring in some extra cash for your family. All that. Plus, we're in the kitchen with Ann Burrell. She's got some delicious ideas to impress the moms on Sunday, because Sunday, of course, Mother's Day. Mother's Wait. Day. Breakfast in bed awaits. And if you are looking for fun things to do now that summer's approaching, you've come to the right place. We've got a lineup of all the hot events happening that you don't want to miss out on. It's all coming up right now on Today in 30. We'll start with NBC's Kristen Welker at the White House. Kristen, good morning. Hi, Savannah and Hoda. Good morning to both of you. The fallout is intensifying this morning after that unprecedented leak of a Supreme Court draft suggesting the court is poised to overturn Roe v. Wade. In a blistering statement, as you say, Chief Justice John Roberts confirmed the authenticity of the draft while calling the leak a betrayal and affront to the court and saying the court martial will investigate. All of it could append the midterms with Democrats fighting to hold on to their majorities and Republicans looking to take back control of Congress. Overnight, that bombshell from the Supreme Court continuing to rock Washington and the country, firing up protesters on both sides. After the high court authenticated that leaked draft opinion by Justice Samuel Alito, which finds the 1973 Roe v. Wade ruling, which protects a woman's right to an abortion, was, quote, egregiously wrong from the start. Justices can and do change their positions before a final decision. But the draft shows four other conservatives joining Alito, Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch, Amy Coney Barrett and Brett Kavanaugh. The three Democratic appointed justices would likely dissent. Chief Justice John Roberts' opinion still unclear. Based on the draft, there are enough votes to overthrow the decision that has established a federal right to abortion since 1973. If that happens, access to abortion would become a patchwork system across the country in the hands of the states, something many opponents of abortion rights have been pushing for. Every state should have the right to allow consensus in its state to make its way into the law. 
Democrats now aiming to energize voters around their message. Roe v. Wade should be codified into law by Congress. But currently, there's not enough support in Congress for such a move. President Biden warning Republicans could try to take away other rights that were granted by the high court, from contraception to same-sex marriage. It would mean that every other decision related to the notion of privacy is thrown into question. Senator Elizabeth Warren joining a protest yesterday. I am angry because of who will pay the price for this. For their part, many Republicans cheered the possibility that Roe could be overturned, but blasted the leak itself. If it's a conservative, you're a traitor to the cause. If it's a liberal, you're the dumbest person in Washington. Moderate Republican Senator Susan Collins, who voted to confirm conservative justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, says she feels misled by their responses about Roe v. Wade during their respective confirmation hearings. Settled as a precedent of the Supreme Court. That's the law of the land. I accept the law of the land. Now, Senator Collins saying if the draft opinion is the final decision on Roe versus Wade, it would be, quote, completely inconsistent with what Justices Kavanaugh and Gorsuch said in their hearings and in their private meetings with her. As for the case itself, the Supreme Court is expected to issue a final ruling within the next two months. Savannah. All right, Kristen Walker at the White House. Thank you. And as you just saw, the battle lines are quickly being drawn from coast to coast with people on both sides of this emotional issue given new fuel for their arguments. So what is next? NBC's Blaine Alexander is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana with that part of the story. Hey, Blaine, good morning. Well, Hoda, good morning to you. This abortion clinic here in Baton Rouge is one of three in the state of Louisiana, all of which would be immediately impacted if Roe were to be overturned. It's because of what's known as a trigger law, something that nearly a third of the country already has in place. From Chicago to San Diego. Abortion is oppression! New York to the nation's capital, the fight over abortion rights is spilling into the streets. I've always supported life. I believe that every child should be born. I'm afraid for my daughters. I'm afraid for my future granddaughters. I'm afraid for all women. Even as the nation's highest court says the bombshell leaked draft is not a final ruling, states are already swiftly preparing for action should the court strike down the landmark decision protecting abortion access. If Roe v. Wade is eventually overturned, it will fall to each state to control abortion access. At least 20 would likely ban the procedure outright, 13 of those through so-called trigger laws, automatically outlawing abortions immediately with few exceptions. It comes as some Republican-led states are already enacting a flurry of restrictive abortion laws. Arkansas is a pro-life state. Uh, we have already put a trigger law in place. In Oklahoma, the governor signed a law Tuesday banning the procedure after six weeks. And while 16 states have already passed laws codifying the right to abortion, Connecticut has gone one step further, passing a bill to expand the list of medical professionals who can perform the procedure. Half of this country, like Connecticut, led by Connecticut, will respect women, patients, doctors. Nationwide, clinics say their patients will be caught in the middle. It does make my job harder knowing that women won't be able to access. Shannon Brewer is director of Mississippi's only abortion clinic, the one at the center of the Supreme Court case. You're going to see an influx of women doing um, things that they that are unsafe because out of being desperate. And back to that new law in Oklahoma. It's just hours old, but the impact already stretches well beyond Oklahoma's borders to women who have come to the state from other states, including Texas, to get the procedure. Hoda. All right, Blaine Alexander for us. Blaine, thank you. Now to that stunning story from Los Angeles overnight. Comedian Dave Chappelle violently attacked while he was on stage at the Hollywood Bowl. NBC's Miguel Almaguer is in L.A. with the story. Hey, Miguel, good morning. Hi, guys. Good morning. Yes, scary moments indeed. Dave Chappelle was doing stand-up as part of the Netflix is a Joke Festival when a man jumped on stage and on top of the star. This whole incident now under investigation. Chaotic moments on stage for comedian Dave Chappelle Tuesday night after a man attacked him during his set at the Hollywood Bowl. Los Angeles police confirming Chappelle was attacked during his live show by a male suspect armed with a weapon called a replica gun. 
that when discharged correctly, ejects a knife blade. In video footage posted to social media, a man is seen running on stage and tackling the 48-year-old comedian during his set at the Netflix is a joke festival. The LAPD says the suspect was in the audience attending the show. When Chappelle was about to exit, the man jumped on stage, rushing at him, attempting to tackle him. It's another incident with a comedian on stage after that Oscar slap seen around the world. Will Smith just smacked out of me. And in an only in Hollywood twist, video posted last night showing Chris Rock joining Chappelle on stage after the attack. Was that Will Smith? In recent months, Chappelle has been criticized for including what some have described as transphobic material in last year's Netflix comedy special, The Closer. But there was no immediate details regarding a possible motive. Uniform security hired for the show intervened, pulling the man off Chappelle, detaining the suspect. Video shows security restraining the suspect backstage at the Hollywood Bowl and show a man on a stretcher being placed in an ambulance. LAPD confirming that the man who rushed the stage was taken to the hospital for injuries and evaluated. Chappelle was not injured in the attack. After the incident, Chappelle seen returning to the stage with actor Jamie Foxx, fans cheering him on. A wild night for the comedian that was no laughing matter. I can't believe all of that, that Chris Rock was there and everything. But let's talk about uh, charges, potential charges. What do they look like? Well, it's currently an active investigation and no one has been charged yet, but we could see that change soon once the suspect is released from the hospital. As for a motive, it's still unclear, but police are expected to interview the suspect as well as Dave Chappelle himself as witnesses it began to begin to unfold the events of what happened there. Hoda, back to you. All right, Miguel, uh, thank you. So many questions. Yeah. There. How did it get on stage? Yes. Where was security? Yes. All How that are folks stuff? getting that close yeah. to folks performing yeah. on stage? Yeah. It's like the third example we've seen of the last yeah. year. Yeah. The fact that Chris Rock happened to be that there. Was, I mean, yeah. the jokes write themselves yes. at that point. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. NBC News. Streaming free now. back with today's consumer this morning it is all about inflation busters yeah as the day-to-day -day cost of living soars a lot of Americans including the 60% now living paycheck to paycheck are looking for ways to increase their cash flow yes NBC senior consumer investigative correspondent Vicki Wynn is on it more ways to make more money Vic mm -hmm. good morning to you we're talking about the side hustle the side hustle so what's your criteria for like a good side hustle what should people be looking for three things right off the bat how much cash can you really make? What's the schedule? Is it going to fit in with your regular hustle? And finally, maybe this is a growth potential opportunity. Could you leverage it into a full-time job? Okay, you've broken it down into a few categories. So first up, 
hustle from home, yes. which works for a lot of folks and also moms, you yes. know, who might send the kids off to school and be ready to make some cash. And thankfully, a lot of us have a decent internet connection. So these are all things you can do as long as you can get online. I'm going to start an order of least lucrative and we'll work our way up. So people like doing those online surveys or maybe watching videos or playing video games. You can actually get that's a job for that. Yes. <laughs> it's not a high paying job, depending on how fast you can answer questions, maybe around five bucks and up an hour. Okay. But just be aware that's available. Branded surveys, Survey Junkie, and um, Inbox Dollar, some sites. You're to check answering out. the questions. Yes. Okay. You're answering the questions. This one I like a little bit more. You can mm. go to Upwork or Fiverr and find out about positions where you can be a virtual assistant. You do things like schedule appointments uh, or mm. data entry from your home, and that can sometimes lead to a full time job. And finally, remember when I was taking fast food orders from New York yes. for a restaurant in Tennessee? 10 to $20 an hour working the virtual wow. drive through for Bite Amazing. Ninja. Amazing. Yes. I love it. It looked fun. Too. It was. It really I totally enjoyed it. Yes. Okay, I'm spinning you around yes, a host. Yes, thank Hi, you. honey. Okay. So there are side hustles that you say you can do from home, yes. but there are also side hustles you can actually go somewhere and do it. This what is are those? where I want you to take stock of your talents. What okay. is it that you have a secret skill for? Are you great at math? Maybe you're a great resume writer or essay editor. Okay. Maybe you practiced a bunch of language skills when you were younger. These are all things you can leverage into a job, and you have a friends and family network now online so you can put out the word of mouth hey look I was trained as a chef right I'm ready to give some cooking lessons I mean eventually you with your thing Savannah you could probably do right that. Well, eventually let's not get carried away <laughs> <laughs> okay or interviewing skills tutors are paid $30 to $100 and up per hour wow. these days so that is a good gig that fits into a lot of schedules the other thing I want you to think about is do you have a university or a college in your town okay You're always doing some kind of research and I don't mean blood or tissue donation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, answering qualitative questions. This contributes to the greater good. You help society and you learn and something. And you can make some money by just filling out those Oftentimes, surveys. Oftentimes, yes, they will okay. compensate you for participating in those studies. Okay, sounds yeah. good. Oh, you right. could also go and teach at one of those colleges and Absolutely. universities. Absolutely. You could be an adjunct professor. professor She's college. an ordained yeah. minister. That's, That's true. That's right. That's right. You could charge for that. Okay. So, so this <laughs> next one here, we're talking about free money. Like, this is something that a lot of folks probably aren't even aware of. There may be free money out there for There's, them. There are hundreds of billions of dollars sitting right now that are unclaimed that belong to American taxpayers. Wow. I want you to write down a site, USA.gov. Everything is there to get you to legitimate government sites. And you're wondering, well, how does this money end up unclaimed? Let's say you put down a deposit uh -huh. or an electricity bill or something. You move, they don't know where to mm -hmm. forward your deposit mm -hmm. back to. Or unclaimed pension checks, an insurance payment you have forgotten about. In some cases, people don't track down their tax refund. So right. this money is due to you. And I would say take your family members, go online, enter your name, and remember, you never have to pay money to get the money that is owed to you. We used to do this in our local market. We would go and find people who were owed money, oh, yeah. knock on their door and say, did you know you had 50 bucks or 100 bucks right. waiting for you from the water company? And it was like a nice little payday. I'm Sometimes glad you, it's a lot more. I'm glad you added that red flag, though, because if someone's asking you to pay money to exactly. get money, that's typically no. sound of a scam. Exactly. This next one I had not heard about until, again, Hoda told me about it. You can rent your house <laughs> out. Of knowledge, this you Hoda. can rent your house out. You can rent your own car out. And yes. now you can rent out your pool. You Craig, this is for you. You just recently got a pool if you wanted to. I, that's why I'm all ears. Wow. Wow. 50 bucks an hour up to $250. I'm seeing some wow. pools going for $500. If they've got a cabana, they're really nice. It's the whole Airbnb Verbo concept, right? So Swimmy.com and Swimply.com are two sites that are letting people advertise their backyard pool. Just remember, there is some liability that sure. goes along with this, so you do want to check with your homeowners association or and your homeowners insurance first. Check your mm -hmm. insurance policy. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, Vicky win. Yeah. Vicky, thank you. Side hustle. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Come on. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything That's you need. 
Look who's back together. Oh, I'm so, so happy. I that's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. What comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. I that's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Mother's Day is on <laughs> Sunday, and this year, why not cook for mom at home? And clean up too. Here to make uh, that wasn't in the oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Here to make Dutch baby pancakes and corned beef hash is Ann Burrell, host of Food Network's Worst Cooks in America Celebrity Edition. <laughs> That's so 90s. Love this show. I love bringing everybody back from the 90s, and yes. we love having you here. Good well, morning. It's so good nice to, to be here Welcome and in, in person. person. Yes. I know this oh is gosh. great. So, and I, I have to say, it's thrilling to be back just in time for Mother's Day, right? And it's berry season. It's so berry season. So let's get started. I mean, we're making Dutch baby pancakes, yeah. which are kind of showstoppers they when are. you see them, but quite easy to make. Okay. So okay. we don't really need to tell everyone that. But we start <laughs> off with a little uh, berry compote. So I have some sugar in my pan. Okay. I have about uh, one cup of raspberries and blueberries. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're not a blueberry or raspberry fan, just switch out for whatever kind okay. of berries you like. I have the zest and juice of one lemon mm -hmm. and, and a cinnamon stick. Oh, so yeah, the zest is where most of the flavor of a citrus mm -hmm. Is. And okay. it's just the colored part. So you just mix that around and you let it get bubbly mm -hmm. and until it cooks down and gets a little syrupy and voila, okay. finished. Okay. And that's your syrup. Thick. So and then you know we always like things to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. So we're we're going to do a little sliced uh, strawberries. Oh, to add to um, it. Yep. And so we, you don't have so, just a clump of compote on top. Exactly. Got we it. like that like fresh bite of the berry. Yes. Um, and so we put some sugar on these. More sugar. Yeah. Oh, we're macerating oh, hello. again. Macerating. It's for mom. Oh, wow. Yes, Fancy. we're all macerating like together. To <laughs> Which what is that macerating? Is, just pushing? Um, well, no, we're not going to mush. We okay. just kind of marinate the strawberries um, with some sugar, and it kind of makes them soften and oh. start to pull out their natural mm -hmm. juices. Talk it's amazing. Is that orange situation. zest? Orange zest. Okay. Yes, I love that really. Like citrus zest just mm. brings a beautiful mm -hmm. freshness to the whole situation. Now, for the pancake batter, um, and by the way, these can all be done yesterday. Oh, okay. okay. I like and that. I'll make a head. This, the pancake batter is best if you make it yesterday. So then when you get oh. up to make brunch for mom, all you have to do is pop these in the Oven. So you just put the bat okay. keep the batter in the fridge overnight? Yes. Okay. So it's uh, some eggs, some milk. Some Regular milk, that's whole milk. Right? Whole milk, okay. three eggs. I mean, these beautiful eggs with the super orange yes. yolks. Um, about a half a cup of flour. Just all-purpose flour? Yep, AP flour, two melted tablespoons butter. of melted butter, some sugar. More okay. sugar. I mean, there we go. I mean, it's it's got to be sweet for mom. Day, come on. And a little vanilla extract, and then you just put everything in the blender. Oh, yeah, this instead of a mixer, right? Yes, Why is like this? this, because you really want the uh, the mixture to get very, very smooth. Okay, um, so it and looks kind of like a no milkshake. lumps. Okay, um, and this does it effectively, really okay. quickly. Mm -hmm. We gotta so, keep going. And there so we go. Voila. Nice. Okay, and then it turns that's into pretty that. much done. Okay, so you like using a cast iron? So for this, you can use a cast iron pan. I mean, I have to say, I do love a cast iron pan. It yeah. gives me the like the ground feels. Um, so you preheat the pan in the oven. Okay. And then you pull it out and be careful because this pan will be hot. So yes. we don't want to grab it like right. that. Oh, Melt some butter in there. And that's Just good. Pour the, the whole thing, oh, the whole the whole thing. thing oh. right in there. That's good. By making the batter the day ahead, it will help your Dutch baby know, right? rise up really and nice and tall. Oh, We're my wasting goodness. your time. We're wasting yours. And then we just try we just we uh, finish it. it. We want to get to the corn beef. We gotta get to the corn beef. All right, we gotta we gotta get to the big 
big skillet man. with. So we just finished this guy up with some berry compote, some strawberries, and some Beautiful. whipped cream. I'll finish it up myself. Oh my there you go. Perfect. Gorge. So what's, 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 oh what's in the... Uh, so ooh, corned beef hash, I, like I mean, this. I love a hash. It just mm. makes me think of Sunday mornings mm -hmm. when I was a kid. So we saute some onions. Mm. We have uh, some Yukon gold potatoes that we have diced up yes. and then boiled them. And then we're just going to add everybody together. Okay, so, so they're already cooked um, through. Yep. Exactly. So good. Um, you get the sweet and the savory. Right? I mean, and so this, if you're not oh, a wow. sweet person or you're not a savory person, mm -hmm. this is also beautiful, topped with some eggs, fried, poached. Oh, my goodness. Like, however you want. This is so delicious. So right. you add in the... Mm. So some potatoes, some onions, some corned beef. And so I like to use hot cherry peppers. If you guys oh, are not, a, they okay. have a tendency to be very spicy. Mm -hmm. So if you're not, you can just substitute. Just get those at the store. It adds yeah. a nice right. tang, though. Right? Oh Roasted gosh. red peppers or pepper so juice. And then you just finish it up like that. Top it I with a little it. parsley, and voila. Thank that's you brunch so for much. Mom. Mm. Oh, my gosh. You have to try these recipes. To get them, head to today.com slash food. And, of course, be sure to check out this season of Worst Cooks in America Celebrity Edition, uh, Sunday night on Food Network. Well done, Ann Burrell. Well, who made Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Just as the weather's starting to heat up a little bit here, so too are all the big music festivals and summer events. This year, you don't want to miss a thing. I think we spent a few years missing out on a lot of things, so we're going to get the party started with Sirius XM Hits One morning mashup host, Nicole Ryan. We share a studio over oh. there. Yes, we do. Hey, girl. <laughs> all right, let's get started. Lady Gaga, she, she's hitting the road, huh? Um, she is hitting the road, and this is the first time since her Joanne tour. This is the Chromatica, um, oh, yeah. uh, yes, the Chromatica Ball Tour. Wow. Uh, this is a stadium tour. Super we're super excited about this. You know, she has been doing, she had a, a residency in Vegas. Oh, right, right. That she was doing for a little while. But, you know, we also had a Sirius XM subscriber event, an exclusive yeah. subscriber event that we did at the Apollo here in New York. Yeah. And I'm just saying, uh, seeing Lady Gaga is life changing. Is oh. it? So, this yeah. is the ticket that you, you got to see. Especially okay. in that yeah. big stadium vibe, yes. all that. Absolutely. Um, how about Alicia Keys, oh. one of the best, most talented people on yes. earth? Yes. And she her. has not been on stage in a very long time. This is the world tour. She's going to be uh, taking over Europe, North America. This is going to to be one that is uh, for the books. Watching Super her on stage, just all she has to do is hear her on a piano, yes. and then yeah. we're all done. I mean, she out. sits down at the piano, and we all That's lose it. it. Yeah. No. Dying. Yes. All right, Kenny Chesney. I mean, we adore him anyway, but yeah. what's he going to be doing? So this he is has not been on stage in three years. He's kicking his tour off in Tampa. He's going to be hitting all of the big uh, cities, and it's called the Here and Now Tour. Ooh. And yeah, I mean, the guy rocks out. Oh my It's going to be amazing. Are yeah. tickets tough to get for all these things, by the way? I don't think they're necessarily tough to get. Maybe yeah. Yeah. Tough to uh, afford, yes. depending on the show. I guess because a lot of people waited so long that yeah. now's the time. Yeah. Up for lost uh, time and lost revenue. Okay, Bieber. Oh. He's been out on tour for a little bit. What yes. kind of show are, are we talking so about? So he's touring the Justice album, the latest album, and this is a world tour. We all love Bieber. And this album is really an ode to his wife, Haley Bieber. So we're all obsessed with this relationship. And I've heard that like it just oozes from him when he's on stage during this tour. So I'm very, very excited about wow. this one. Wow. Okay, so those are the big music ones that you're looking forward yes. to. Let's move on to comedy. Kevin Hart. 
and Chris Rock wow. are teaming I mean, up wow. on tour. Come on. Could you dream up a better duo? That's so good. It's unbelievable. So they're doing five shows together. They're going to okay. be joined together. And I mean, talk about an expensive show. That yeah. one's going to be yeah. amazing. And then they're obviously doing their own separate things. He is going to, Kevin Hart is going to be going on and kicking his own personal tour off in July. And Chris Rock has already hit the road with his ego death world tour. Um, yeah, I think we're all, we're all wanting to see Chris Rock after what happened recently. Say, we've got a few things to say. Yeah. 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 I believe just, when was it, yesterday, the Hollywood Bowl? Yeah. How, yeah. yeah, Chappelle got hit and yes. he jumped on stage yes. and kind of... Uh, well, he was able to bring some lightness to a really horrible situation yeah. and said, was that guy, was that guy that Will, Will Smith? Smith? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another one of our absolute favorites is Amy Schumer. Yes. She's back on the road. Love her. She's got a 30-date tour called The Whore Tour. Wait, um, wait. I don't know. If, <laughs> wait, yes. for real? Her time. Yes, it is The Whore <laughs> Tour. And uh, she has a new show out called Life and Beth, which is on Hulu. I binged it in one day. Oh, you did? And it tell reminded us. me why I need to have a ticket to this what, show. What is? Yeah, tell, tell us about life and Beth. Um, it's it's her, and it's a little bit you know loosely based on her life with her husband and Michael Sarah's in it, and it's just her. It's mm -hmm. just it's so her humor, and it's just it's delicious. You'll laugh, you'll cry. It's great. She's always funny. Um, yes. We're talking about music festivals. I am sitting here thinking about one music festival in particular. Jazz Fest is the last weekend in April, first weekend in May in New Orleans. It is this this weekend is the final one. Yeah. And people have been, like, just dying to get out and have a music festival. What else yeah. is going on? So we've got Gov Ball, Governor's Ball, which is in uh, here in New York. Very excited. That's one of my favorites. And what that, is that event like? Um, that's what, it really is one of my favorites. Um, this is going to be Kid Cudi, J. Cole, Halsey. Really excited to see Halsey because this will be the first time that she's on the stage since she had a baby. Uh -huh. um, and she always puts on an amazing show. Is this show. an outdoor venue? This is an outdoor okay. venue. Randall's Island. Randall's that Island, yeah. yeah. It's oh, very, fun. it's just everything a festival has. Great food, um, great vendors. It's just, it's yeah. an awesome, awesome event. Okay. Um, we also have, uh, down in New Orleans, we have Essence. <gasps> By the That's, way, Essence Fest is yes. awesome. That's look the 4th of July, right? Chris Rock, yeah. obviously very busy. Oh. I mean, what is with him? Uh, Chris Rock, Janet Jackson, uh, Nicki Minaj, I believe New, uh, New Edition's gonna be there. It's gonna be crazy, and that's at the end of June, June 30th. June 30th, off. yeah, it's usually around the 4th of July. What's great about that event, too, is they always have really inspirational speakers. Like, you go and you hear music, yeah. and then you go into some big venue, and like, Ian Levan Zant is holding you in the palm of your hand, and oh she's, she's yeah. lifting people up. She's really yeah. cool. And then one of my favorites is Lollapalooza, obviously, in Chicago. Yeah. And that's got Machine Gun Kelly and Dua Lipa and Doja Cat. I wow. mean, this is a triple wow. threat right here. I mean, it's just, this is another ticket that I'm, I'm going to need to Where get my hands on. Where are we this summer, Hoda? What? i got a lot of concerts There's to go so to. There's so much. And by the way, we got a ton of, you, you left out the ones that we're having on our plaza, girl. There's a ton of them that are going <laughs> to Oh, yeah, those? If, if you want a free one, we're going to have a whole bunch that will be on our website. You can check them all out. You can listen to Nicole on the morning mashup on Sirius X. XM hits one. Thanks for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having us, guys. Good to see Appreciate it. Why don't you come back tomorrow? We've got another big show for you. Yeah, the cast of Mrs. Doubtfire will be here to close the curtain on our Best of Broadway week. We'll see you soon. Have a great Wednesday. There are dozens of Chinatowns all across America. With interesting architecture, diverse restaurants, and specialty shops, it's no wonder they're popular with locals and tourists alike. They also provide places for new immigrants and for families to create communities. But with gentrification and all sorts of problems from the pandemic, it's no wonder that all these Chinatowns are rapidly changing. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Okay, so it's no surprise. There's incredible food to be found here in Manhattan's Chinatown, folks lining up all the time. But there used to be Chinatowns in cities and towns, big and small, all across this country. In fact, the longest running family owned Chinese restaurant is in a place you might never think of, Butte, Montana. At the turn of the century, Butte, Montana was a bustling mining town. The invention of electricity leading to a demand for conductors like copper. Mining boomed, the city flourishing. 
The demand for labor brought thousands of immigrants to Butte. They came from so many different countries, including Italy, Ireland, and China. It was the classic portrait of the American West, with gambling, saloons, even a red light district. By 1914, Butte's Chinatown was thriving with over 60 Chinese-owned businesses. Now we're going to prepare broccoli beef. My name is Jerry Tam, and I'm the owner of the Pekin Noodle Parlor. The Pekin first opened as a tobacco shop and casino run by Jerry's great uncle, Hum Yao. Two years later, Hum adding a restaurant, and the Pekin Noodle Parlor was born. Well, this building has three different levels. The top level, obviously, is the Pekin Noodle Parlor. And then the second level on the main street used to be a herbal medicine shop. That shop was run by Jerry's great-grandfather, Tam Kuang Yi. It's crazy to think that, you know, everything came over from China at one time. Like, they didn't make soy sauce in America. The noodles were fried and brought over on ships because they didn't make fresh noodles. So the history of this place really holds true that this is a Chinese restaurant, you know, from Chinese immigrants. I met up with culinary historian Grace Young to learn more about America's earliest Chinatown. Where was the first Chinatown and how did it get started? The first Chinatown is San Francisco. The first Chinese came to California uh, for the gold rush and that was 1848. And uh, they came because America needed cheap labor. And so from gold rush, they ended up doing farming, mm. manufacturing, and then eventually they worked on the transcontinental railroad. And the first Chinatown formed because America wanted cheap labor, but they didn't want the Chinese to live with whites. So they were ostracized from white communities. So t talk to me about that first wave of, of Chinese immigration to the U.S. The Chinese came from southern China, from principally from the area of Canton, and there was tremendous prejudice against mm -hmm. the Chinese. They were lynched, and because the Chinese were willing to work for lower wages, they were seen as the reason why Americans were suffering so much. So the blame mm -hmm. was unfairly placed on the Chinese. In 1882, Congress signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law. It banned Chinese from migrating to the U.S. It marks the only time in American history that an entire race or ethnic group was banned from immigrating. But the interesting thing about this Exclusion Act was that there was actually exemption for Chinese tourists, students, teachers, and also merchants. A landmark court case in 1915 classified Chinese restaurant owners as merchants. And it gave them a way to circumvent the Exclusion Act of 1882. It was this exemption that allowed Jerry's great uncle to open Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, paving a path for more family members to immigrate to the U.S. and help the business. Jerry's father, Danny Wong arrived in the U.S. in 1947 as a teenager. Ever since he was 14 years old, he's been working at the Pekin Noodle Parlor, and he just started with the simple rolls of washing dishes, and then he learned how to cook, and then he slowly just started integrating himself into, you know, managing it and working with the waitresses and the staff. Danny taking over the restaurant in the 1950s spending years turning it into a pillar of the local community. Well, I've been coming here for at least 50 years, and they give me plenty of food. I never walk away hungry. I love coming to work because of all the people I work with. Like, they choose really nice people. And I mean, my father probably employed over 10,000 people at this, you know, throughout his whole entire life. So it's interesting to know that there's nearly five to six generations of people that, you know, have worked here. The menu at Pekin Noodle Parlor hasn't changed much over the years. We do a thing called chop suey, and what chop suey is is tidbits of leftover uh, vegetables that were kind of mixed together in its own gravy and served on top of chow mein noodles. We've been serving it for over 110 years. Chop suey is in large part why Chinese food became so popular across the United States. Chop suey was the first time America experienced a culinary craze a food craze. Mm -hmm. And it's starting at the end of the 19th century 
that there are Americans who are venturing into Chinatown. The way they got them to even experiment with Chinese food was to make a stir fry that was actually quite bland. Mm -hmm. So they used bamboo shoots, water chestnuts, onions, uh, oftentimes there was celery. For many years, Chinatowns were the only places where non-Chinese Americans could sample Asian flavors. Americans were going into Chinatown, some were curious, they wanted to experience curio shops, Chinese operas. With increased tourism, Chinatowns and large cities grew, but it was a different story in Montana. Like many mining towns, Butte lost many of its workers as production slowed in the 1950s. Once the copper ground dry, then the people just started to pick up and just kind of move on, move on and move back to their families and the bigger states. As miners left Butte for new opportunities, its Chinatown disappeared. In the early 1900s, there were seven chop suey restaurants listed in the Butte City Directory. Today, only the Pekin Noodle Parlor remains open. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. Jerry Tam runs the Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, Montana. People may know this is the oldest Chinese restaurant in America, but below it is so much history. Despite Pekin's historic status, Jerry says he was never pressured by family to join the business. I never learned to cook until I came back, uh, back in around 2009, because my any Asian American, my parents wanted all of their kids to go to college, so we all went to colleges around the nation and to get a better education, to become a lawyer, a doctor, and what have you. But I went into fashion, and what was great about that is I got to see the world because of it. In 2004, Jerry even appearing on Bravo's Project Runway. But a few years later, family duty calling him home. And unfortunately, my mom had a stroke, so my dad needed help, you know, taking care of her and take care of the restaurant. I think it was really hard on my father because they were in a generation where they loved each other every day. And they were just best friends. After Jerry's mom passed, Jerry and his dad began operating Pekin together. He never stopped working, so he was working here all the way until 85, until he couldn't make up the stairs anymore. My father and I spent every day together. I made sure he was, uh, he was healthy all the way till the end, the best of my ability I can do. My, my father passed in November, and it was really, you know, heartbreaking. He didn't want to say goodbye to my sisters or me or this restaurant or the community. He loved View Montana. Jerry now runs Pekin Noodle Parlor with his cousin Nelson. Together, they're working to preserve a family legacy and keep a piece of Chinese-American history alive in an unlikely place. I've been asked the question, what is the future of the Pekin? And the best answer I can give you is, let's just keep it the same. Let's not change anything. 
because that's what people come here for. They have their parking spots, they have their booths, they have their favorite place to sit at the bar. I don't think they want any change because this is a place that feels like home. Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. While New York City is home to America's largest Chinatown, the honor of the oldest goes to San Francisco. And that's where the Far East Cafe is located. It is one of the last remaining historic Chinese banquet halls. After a two year hiatus, this celebrated venue hosted the 64th annual Miss Chinatown USA pageant, a Lunar New Year tradition. The occasion marking a triumphant milestone for this century old institution. Bill Lee has owned the Far East Cafe since 1999. His daughter Kathy working by his side as the manager. He brought me into the restaurant to kind of understand the roots of our culture. He wanted me to remember that, you know, Chinatown is about community, is about traditions, is about culture. For many in the community, Chinese banquet halls are more than just venues for special events. I feel that Far East is kind of like a second home for, you know, a lot of our patrons that come in because they feel so comfortable. So much history and so many memories, you know. A lot of patrons that have been here, they told me, they're like, oh, my parents had my red egg ginger party. It's very similar to like a baptism. And that was like 50 something years ago. And that history is everywhere you look at Far East. The ceilings. But like my dad mentioned, the high ceilings, the moldings, the moldings are all original and the lanterns were all imported from China uh, in the 1920s. So they're over 100 plus years old. For the last few decades, there were five giant banquet style restaurants in San Francisco's Chinatown. But with rising rents and gentrification, most have since closed their doors. By early 2020, only two banquet halls remained. The Far East Cafe planned to celebrate its 100 year anniversary with a big celebration. Instead, it's now planning to close its doors. At the start of the pandemic, the restaurant stayed afloat by cooking meals for senior citizens and low income residents in Chinatown. We applied for a PPP loan and we got over $200,000. We also received money from the feed and fuel program. Then our landlord gave us six months of free rent. Beyond COVID, a different type of virus 
brought more harm to Chinatowns across the country. Anti-Asian hate crimes soaring by nearly 340% in 2021. When this started happening, I felt very, very sad and also very angry because I'm like, why is this happening to Chinatown? Why is it happening to our community? You know, for these people to target elderly people, to push them down, to rob them, don't they realize that they have grandparents too, or they have parents that are that age? And if that happened to their parents, how would they feel? Then could be People saw the attacks when they watched the news and heard reports, and they got even more scared. They don't want to go out, even for special events like the Mid-Autumn Festival. We tried to invite them, but they didn't want to come. We used to be open until 10 o'clock before pandemic. Sometimes we would stay out here until midnight if we had events. Now, we can't. We can't do that. We changed the business hours to close at 7, 7.30, because safety is the most important thing. Business owners across Chinatown still face hostility. George and Cindy Chen opened China Live in 2017. We've been lucky. Uh, we've only had a couple instances where, you know, people scream uh, anti-Asian slurs. And we're concerned about our employees, you know, coming to work and, and being harassed. I, I think that ignorance is uh, very unfortunate. China Live is a massive marketplace with multiple restaurants. It's in a building that once housed a banquet hall like Far East. I remember coming to a wedding here when I was in college, and there were, I think, I think literally 5,000 people in like six restaurants. But unfortunately, you know, real estate was getting very expensive, so it's not very cost effective if you don't have that business. But two years ago, the couple had to lay off 200 workers. However, with the support of partners, George and Cindy were able to pivot their business on a few fronts. We did, you know, the ghost kitchen was selling outside our box. So we have 10 locations in the Bay Area, from San Jose to Berkeley, and, uh, and they can order food from those ghost kitchens. Ghost kitchens prepare restaurant quality food exclusively for delivery or takeout. We sold so many Peking ducks, we didn't know what to do with all the duck fat. So what do you do? You make popcorn with it. So that's why we have a duck fat popcorn. As business picked up, China Live was able to rehire 100 workers. Despite an uncertain future, these restaurants remain hopeful that business will rebound. More police presence, People are more, as a community, standing up for ourselves, making sure that we have like the buddy system, making sure that we're together and we feel safe, that we're walking together, that we have each other's back. I mean, dining out is an essential part of life, right? I mean, one more fun is to look forward to having dinner with friends you haven't seen at a new place or a old favorite place. But some old favorites just can't be replaced. During the pandemic, many restaurants have shut down. Far East is now the biggest restaurant in Chinatown. If Far East closes, there won't be space big enough to host large events for the community. We were overjoyed having that Miss Chinatown USA event here, a press conference, and just being able to reconnect with the community. It warmed my heart. And my dad was just like so overjoyed that people were coming in just to celebrate. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. Good evening from
from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking down. Yeah. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. To learn more about the future of Chinese American restaurants, I went to visit Chef Lucas Sin in New York City. This savvy chef is on a mission to save mom and pop shops from closing and putting a spin on the classics. Hey, Ow, nice to meet good you. To see you. All right, can't wait to yeah, talk come and in, taste. Come in, come in here, come in here. Lucas was born and raised in Hong Kong. Growing up, he had never heard of dishes like General Tso's chicken. What was your first experience with Chinese American food? Yeah. And did you go, what the heck is this? I was here for summer camp, and uh, on Tuesdays, at 10 o'clock or so, right before bedtime, this van would pull up in the front of the school, um, and you could pick between sesame chicken, general Tso's chicken, orange chicken with broccoli and fried rice or white rice or whatever it was. The first thought was that this is ridiculously delicious, whereas it's been my whole life. And the second thought is that what in the world is the difference between orange chicken and general Tso's chicken and sesame chicken? Why is there so much that I don't understand about this if last time I checked it was Chinese? Lucas actually studying cognitive science at Yale, but he always had a passion for cooking. His summers spent training in award-winning restaurants in Hong Kong and Japan. After graduating in 2015, Lucas opened his first restaurant with Yale classmate Yang Zhao. Junzi Kitchen is a fast casual chain that serves modern Chinese fare. But Lucas remained passionate about the Chinese American cuisine he first tasted as a boy. So, so how did Chinese American food, the food that we have become uh, familiar with, how did that develop? How yeah. did that happen? Now, Chinese takeout is interesting, right? Because it's all over the United States. Yeah. So these folks come in, they yeah. Yeah. apprentice in a restaurant, right. they learn those recipes, and they then go move somewhere on else, right? To open their own exactly. restaurant. Exactly. And then their cousins come from Fujian, and then those recipes are passed on. And there's a remarkable similarity to, to, to these dishes. Despite the popularity of Chinese American food, many family-owned restaurants that once dotted Chinatowns and other urban areas have been closing for years. Opening restaurants is really difficult, and running restaurants is perhaps even more difficult. These moms and dads open these restaurants so that their kids can go to university and become lawyers and doctors and television hosts and whatnot. And now that they're finally able to do that, they don't need to run these restaurants anymore, right? The li suddenly, livelihoods have changed. That's a good thing. Lucas and Young hatched an idea to help smaller businesses in 2019. Nice Day seeks out restaurants facing closure, then works with the owners to remodel the space and update the menus. The pandemic stalled the team's initial plans, but the second location in Long Island is slated to open this spring. It's important to me that these new Chinese American takeout restaurants that we're building called Nice Day work with the previous generation of owners because they have a lot of knowledge that mm -hmm. we don't. They know their customers, they know what sells, um, they know how to cook these dishes, they have recipes. You raise an interesting point, Lucas, mm -hmm. in that you talk to these retired mm -hmm. Chinese restaurant owners. I is that part of the, the, the sense of trying to memorialize mm -hmm. what could be lost? Now, preserving recipes is part of it. But the other important part is preserving the way business is done. Chinese takeout restaurants are one of the few restaurants in the world that if they're open from, let's say, 11 to 10, the work hours are 11 to 10. They don't have any prep hours. The same cooks that do the wok stir fries are also prepping during the day. It's ridiculously efficient, and it's got to do with the setup and the way that the kitchens are run. But it's also important to us that we give back to this last generation and that we can make sure that owners who want to retire can retire well, and that that legacy can be preserved in a new type of American Chinese takeout restaurant. While Nice Day pays homage to popular Chinese American recipes, Lucas has been celebrated for his innovative fusion dishes. In 2021, he was named one of Food & Wine's Best New Chefs. 
We serve a mapo mac and cheese yeah. here, which yeah. is a variation on that dish. It's fusiony and it's silly and it's just an attempt to do something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it betrays every chef sensibility that I have, but unfortunately it's delicious and it's interesting and it gets people talking. Finally, it's time to eat. Lucas showing me how to make his signature dish. How do we get started? So the mapo mac and cheese, the mac and the cheese elements are rigorously American. Mm -hmm. These are, this is elbow macaroni right. uh, cooked halfway. And this is Velveeta. Um, but the mapo element is going to be in the form of a mapo sauce, if you will. The last two elements that really sort of take this over the edge is um, Chinese sausage. Oh. It, it can function like bacon and some dried shiitake mushrooms that we've rehydrated. So um, to start off with, we're just gonna cut a couple of things. And this tofu, we will then put into the deep fryer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This concludes the chopping portion of our program. <laughs> Next, garlic and ginger are cooked till fragrant. Then, spicy bean paste and soybean paste are added to start the sauce. Mushroom broth is added, the mixture brought to a boil so the flavors infuse. Can I give that a try? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's here you go. So your left hand's on the walk? Yeah. Yes. I can't, I, can't, I can't get any altitude on this thing. Nothing's coming up. And that's why the pros do it, baby. At this point, everything's smelling quite good. Uh -huh. So the macaroni is going to go in, as well as the soup we just made. Once it's boiling and happy, two slices of the best of the best. Velveeta. Velveeta American cheese. Wait for that Velveeta to melt. Uh -huh. You'll see that that sauce is already beautifully tied together. We like to play this dish in the Chinese takeout box. Oh, wow. Because it's silly. Well, um, why not? <laughs> it's fun. Boom. Some fried tofu puffs as croutons go over the top. That's a little bit of texture and the homage to the original Mapo tofu. These fresh scallions are actually really important because they cut through the heaviness mm -hmm. of the original dish. Wow. There's a little spice, the creaminess, the crunch of the, the tofu. I hope you get, yeah, get a little, little bit of the sausage. sausage, yeah. Whoa. You've never had mac and cheese like this. <laughs> <laughs> Amid a global pandemic, changing family dynamics, and anti-Asian racism, Chinatowns across America and the communities that sustain them face a challenging road ahead. Every business that is open right now is still fighting for its life. And I think that the best way to fight the anti-Asian hate is to show our love for the community. Come to Chinatown or your local Asian American Pacific Islander restaurant, store, market. Give them your business. We have lost so much during the pandemic, and I think it makes us all so much more conscious that we have to protect what we love. Shockwaves. The Supreme Court confirms the authenticity of that draft opinion overturning Roe v. Wade and the battle lines hardened from coast to coast. How dare they tell a woman what she can do and cannot do with her own body? The Chief Justice calling the leak a betrayal and launching an investigation as both sides point fingers. If it's a conservative, you're a traitor to the cause. If it's a liberal, you're the dumbest person in Washington. Complete coverage straight ahead. Breaking overnight, Trump card. J.D. Vance prevails in Ohio's closely watched Republican Senate primary, the come from behind victor after a late endorsement from the former president. Ladies and gentlemen, it ain't the death of the America First agenda. This morning, what it means for the race to hold Congress in this fall's crucial midterms. All eyes on the Fed, another key interest rate hike expected today. A new step in the fight to lower record inflation. Will it work? And where your costs are going up. 
Walk Out, new video of the moment a convicted felon now on the run fled an Alabama jail. Alongside the corrections officer, police believe helped him escape. What investigators are now revealing about their relationship as the manhunt enters day six. We're live with the latest. All that plus round two, millions in the Midwest bracing for another day of severe weather, including the potential for more tornadoes, which you can expect and where the threat is headed next. And no laughing matter. Overnight, comedian Dave Chappelle attacked by a man who stormed the stage during a performance at LA's iconic Hollywood Bowl. Inside the alarming breach, what police are saying about the suspect and the other comedian who just happened to be there. Was that Will Smith? Today, Wednesday, May 4th, 2022. From NBC News, this is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Oda Cutby. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today, 7 a.m. on the West Coast, and it's good to have you with us. Just ahead, guys, we have a live report from L.A. on that onstage scare for Dave Chappelle. And now to that breaking news overnight from Ohio, the results of a closely watched primary race with national implications. The Republican who received a late endorsement from former President Trump securing his party's nomination for the U.S. Senate. NBC's Jesse Kirsch in Cleveland for us this morning. Jesse, good morning to you. Savannah, good morning. The state Senate primary race, a pivotal test of the former president's influence over the Republican Party. J.D. Vance, the well-known author of Hillbilly Elegy, got a late bump in the race after an endorsement for Mr. Trump. And last night, he cruised to victory. This morning, former President Donald Trump's grip on the Republican Party looks even into the pivotal midterm elections this fall. I love you, too. Overnight, J.D. Vance projected the winner of Ohio's raucous Republican Senate primary, beating out six other candidates. His profile surging in the final weeks of the race after a late endorsement from the 45th president. Some voters skeptical of the hillbilly elegy author who previously took swipes at Trump and his supporters, but others unfazed. I believe that he will do good for this country. The high profile race featured several candidates, all tying themselves to Trump's policy, messaging or both. They wanted to write a story that this campaign would be the death of Donald Trump's America First agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, it ain't the death of the America First agenda. On Sunday, Trump confusing Vance with rival Josh Mandel. We've endorsed JP, right? JD Mandel, and he's doing great. Then tempering expectations Tuesday after the polls opened. They're all very good. Everybody's good, but I think JD's best suited to win the election. Vance will face off against Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan. We have to put workers front and center in the economy in the United States of America, not the hedge funds, not the banks. Vance's victory in Ohio seen by some as a roadmap for Republicans hoping to regain control of Congress, only needing a net pickup of five House seats and just one in the deadlocked Senate. Also at stake, President Biden's agenda, with midterm elections usually a referendum on the incumbent president. Recent polls showing more than half the country disapproves of Biden's job performance, driven by concerns about the flailing economy. Midterm seen as an uphill battle for Democrats, one that could shift the balance of power in Washington for the next two years. The question now here in Ohio is can Democrats attract moderate Republicans and independents who might be put off by Vance's hard right positions? One moderate Republican I spoke with last night said he plans to vote for the Democrats. So even if the Trump playbook works in the primaries, it's still unclear if it will be successful this fall as well. Savannah. All right. That's the question. Jesse, thank you. Turning now to the war in Ukraine, Russian forces unleashing a series of new attacks overnight. One of them aimed directly at that besieged steel plant in Mariupol where civilians remain holed up inside. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin joins us now with the very latest. Hey, Aaron, good morning. Hoda, good morning. Today, the European Commission announced its plan to phase out Russian oil imports. Uh, as soon as possible, really by the end of the year, as in all eyes are in Kharkiv at this point where Ukrainian forces are working to clear the devastation left behind by Russian troops.
On the outskirts of the northeastern city of Kharkiv, Ukrainian troops survey the death and destruction the Russians left behind after reclaiming control of at least 11 villages, according to Ukrainian authorities. Meanwhile, after three days traveling on what's been described as the road from hell, buses of civilians finally arrived on safe Ukrainian territory from the devastated city of Mariupol. More than 100 women and children, many thought they might never live to see this moment. For weeks, they were trapped inside the nuclear bunker of an old steel plant, the last Ukrainian stronghold of the besieged city, surrounded by Russian forces with no way out. You can't imagine how scary it is when you sit in the shelter in a wet and damp basement, which is bouncing, shaking, she says. Until the UN and Red Cross managed what seemed impossible, negotiating a break in the fighting. Just enough time for some to escape, but many were left behind. 14-year-old Vova made it out with his mom and brother, but his father, a Ukrainian fighter, is still in the plant. He spoke to NBC's Matt Bradley. What did your father tell you when you left? What did he say to you? He said we'd meet each other soon. Save us of style. In Kyiv Tuesday, the wives and mothers of the trapped Ukrainian fighters marched to President Zelensky's office for help. Amidst reports, Russian troops were storming the plant. The ICRC says it's working to secure more evacuations. You need uh, to pass checkpoints. You need to talk. Uh, to the parties to the conflict, things on the ground change by the minute. Uh, we, ha we have to remember this is an active conflict zone. What's your message to someone who's been left behind? We have not forgotten the people in Mariupol, in Azovstal, and we're working round the clock tirelessly to get people out wherever they are trapped. With the plant once again being relentlessly bombarded, hope of another rescue mission fades with each explosion. Ukrainian officials say four more evacuations are planned for the Mariupol area today, although none from that besieged steel plant. Hoda? Where it's needed most. All right, Aaron McLaughlin for us there. Aaron, thank you. Craig is with us now on the Money Beat this morning. Good morning. Yes, Money Beat indeed, Savannah. Hoda, good morning. Good morning to you as well. From Wall Street to Main Street, all eyes are on the Federal Reserve today, expected to announce another hike to interest rates aimed at driving down that soaring inflation we've been all feeling. So how will you be impacted? NBC's business and tech correspondent Jolene Kent joins us now. Joe, good morning. Hey, Craig, good morning. Big day today. The Fed is set to unleash its biggest rate hike since 2000 as it tries to get inflation under control. So put simply here, by raising interest rates again, it'll get more expensive to take out new loans. Credit card interest rates go up. The idea here is to cool off all this demand for buying things in this pandemic. And the high prices you see will come back down to earth. But this is a delicate balancing act as the Fed tries to avoid stoking a recession. This morning, the cost of borrowing money is set to rise. It comes as the Federal Reserve is expected to hike interest rates once again, this time by up to half a percentage point, the largest increase in more than two decades. The move is the Fed's attempt to rein in soaring inflation, which is weighing heavily on budgets everywhere, from the pump to the grocery store. My grocery bills are getting larger and larger, not only because I have a preteen, um, but because the prices are going up. The goal is if borrowing money becomes more expensive, demand will drop and prices will go back down. But economists are split on whether or not the move will ultimately bring relief to the cost of living. Some fearing raising rates too quickly could trigger a recession. In the meantime, the price of new mortgages will immediately jump, raising home prices dramatically for some. I mean, the rates are going to go up and, you know, the type of houses that we're looking at, the prices aren't really going to go down. Andrew Cardenas worried about paying even more for his dream home in Nashville, motivating him and his family to secure their big purchase as soon as possible. How far did you have to stretch to make this new house happen? Uh, we had to put about 8 percent over asking price um, on an already very expensive house. Another rate hike would also bump up the price of car and adjustable rate loans again and make paying off credit card debt even costlier. With a half point increase, a $5,000 balance would carry an additional $193 in total interest. And the rate hikes are expected to continue through the rest of this year as the Fed tries to strike a delicate balance to get inflation under control.
And for the savers out there, today's expected hike could be good news if you've got one of those high yield savings accounts. And of course, this comes as so many Americans are changing their spending habits just to manage those tight budgets with inflation. Our new NBC News Morning Consult online poll found that six in 10 shoppers say they've decided not to purchase an item because it was too expensive or they're deciding to wait until the price goes down. Craig. All right, Jolene Kent for us. Joe, thank you. All right, busy morning in the mm-hmm. weather department. A whole big mess out there. Yeah, it, is. it is. I mean, it's very gray here in New York. It's going to just be rainy to start off this day, but we are going to see a, a chance of bigger storms through the middle of the country. But let's take you uh, first into the Northeast, where we do have rain extending from just west of Boston all the way back towards Buffalo. Includes New York City. Washington's a little bit gray this morning. We've got some heavy pockets of rain across uh, New England as well, but it's really the middle of the country that'll be a focus later on the this afternoon and tonight, especially in this area of dark orange. This is where we could see our strongest storm. So let's uh, break it down for you a little bit more uh, in a little bit more detail. Oklahoma City down to Wichita Falls. That's where we could see hail two inches or more in diameter. That's about the size of golf balls. So that certainly could be damaging. We also have the threat of some significant tornadoes, uh, EF2 or stronger, as a, a line of storms will develop later on this afternoon. Again, this is that area across uh, south central Oklahoma into parts of Texas as well. And uh, that is going to be uh, the zone we'll watch for today. And then tomorrow it shifts a little farther to the east, including Arkansas, into uh, eastern parts of Texas, where we could see, again, wind gusts over 60 miles per hour, large hail, and a few isolated tornadoes. That's a look at the weather across the country. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking down. Yeah. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking down. Yeah. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. That's your latest forecast. All right, Dylan, thank you. Uh, Just ahead, a shocking scene caught on camera overnight. So comedian Dave Chappelle was attacked on stage in the middle of his routine. We are live with the very latest. Also ahead, the manhunt for that escaped convict and the corrections officer he disappeared with enters day six. And this morning, the new video showing just how easily they walked away from jail and what we're now learning about their relationship. But first, this is Today on NBC. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. 
Still ahead, new details on the imposter who managed to infiltrate a group of soldiers protecting the queen. That's the wild story. The search for answers this morning after that man managed to spend the night at Windsor Castle. We'll go live to London for the very latest. But first, your local news, some weather, and these messages. Welcome to Today All Day. All day? Today All Day. All day. This is a long oh, way of asking. Man, yeah. Who's your okay. favorite character you've ever oh, played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> What is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things. Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the rap of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. My buddy Cal cooking with me. Dad's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today, with simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit <laughs> now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do a weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. Wow. Okay. <laughs> look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't look, look so good. No, it doesn't look good. <laughs> will you okay. judge us in a cook-off? I yeah. will. And okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day. Today Show's newest fan. Little Al Roker. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. you got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good! I love it! Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. What comes back together? Oh, I'm so happy! That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you 